Hello. Back. Excited to be back. Fired up. It's been all night. Reading post-Marxist literature and watching Rick James documentaries. So if you're not ready for a wild show, I don't know what to tell you. So I'm just going to get right into it. No spiel. Because I'm so excited to be with my homies. Coming all the way live from Miami, Florida. You may know him as the man with the Mau Mau. We know him as the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. I'm back in the co-host chair. As you all know, my man Jason was on vacation for two weeks. I did my best. I hope I did not disappoint my people out there. And I did at least a decent enough job that y'all don't want to mow mow me. I think it's the other way around. I think people are going to be like, fuck, we want Pascal back. But I do want to say thank you very much for holding it down. You did a wonderful job uh, from the episodes that I did watch. Also, I want to thank uh, our wonderful fill-in producer that is sleeping in today. A well-deserved weekend sleep in. Mean Jean Bajlan. Oh, by the way, we got to say shout out to a regular, regular viewer of the show who I just noticed she put in the chat. Big supporter. Happy birthday, Shirley. Oh, happy yeah. birthday, Shirley. Happy birthday. Shout out to the birthday. Shirley is one of our regular, regular viewers. Happy birthday, Shirley. I wish I had like a happy birthday, nice thing on the soundboard. I just want to let y'all know, by the way, right? Let's let you know how much we appreciate our This Is Revolution family, particularly our patrons. We appreciate them. We like them very much. We love all our supporters. And we consider them part of our kind of This Is Revolution family ensemble. Yes, because it actually makes the show worth doing, right? Indeed. Now, he used to be the black man in Maine. He is one of many colored folks now just blending in in Virginia. Marcus from the Left Flank Vets. What's up, what's up, what's up? Happy everyone is, is here. Happy birthday, Shirley. Um, number one. She gets a shot five for her birthday. She says shot five. <laughs> And and also here to uh, help us out is another friend of show, friend in real life. He's the host of Pop the Left, theorizing with the hammer, and his very own Varn vlog. He does too many things to to mention here on the show. He reminded me of some more shit that he does. I was like, damn, I forgot you. Did, we did a whole show with you talking about that shit. He is. Maybe Pascal's favorite alabaster leftist. <laughs> Derek Varn. Morning. See Derek Varn in the house. It's uh, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> I, I, came, I came in to talk about the post-Marxism, and I have seen one Wick James documentary about 10 years ago and know some some probably problematic Chappelle show skits, and that's about my knowledge beyond two songs. So Of, of Rick James? <laughs> Look, it's, yeah. it's okay. It's okay. We're going to learn some Rick James shit today. I watched the documentary. I've, I watched every Rick James documentary you can find. I, I am a fan of his music. <laughs> not his how many Rick James documentaries are there? Enough. There are actually, a couple. There are a couple. Enough. I mean, there's a behind know, the music. Which the behind the music. <laughs> yes, it's a, you know that his life kind of took this horrible turn when the whole crack pipe burning happened. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't like he just burned somebody with a crack pipe and that was it. He burned somebody with a crack pipe and he beat somebody else up and it's like, fuck, man, you're really shitting all over your legacy. Yeah. 
as being well, I mean, to be fair, fair, Rick James did not exactly had the most uh silver spoon lined beginning when we start with the, you know mama being a numbers numbers runner ain't exactly gonna send you to, to Groton. You know was that, wasn't that a book? <laughs> wasn't that one of those books like an iceberg slim book? Mama was a numbers runner. <laughs> <laughs> that was not in my post-Marxist reading that I did last night. I did I did do some post-Marxist reading. Um, but let's bring in Dr. Lillian. She is a postdoc at the Institute of Philosophy at the Free University of Berlin. Her areas of specialization are political philosophy, feminist philosophy, and hot topic critical theory. Her research is about capitalism, structural injustice, and the intersection of the two, especially the ways in which capitalism influences experiences of social group oppression. Her work also asks how contexts of structural injustice frame the way that we think about our normative criteria for justice in terms of democratic rights and participation. Please welcome, coming all the way from Germany, Dr. Oh, also, I forgot. She is the co-host of the Left of Philosophy podcast. You guys should all subscribe. There should be a link in the description. If not, I think moderator extraordinaire M. Toussaint will put one in there. Dr. Lillian. Hey everyone, thanks for having me. Can you hear me with my microphone? Oh, we can hear you just fine. We can hear you. Your microphone sounds. I was better. hoping you would come in a little earlier so oh, no. we could get the pronunciation of your, and by we, I mean me, of your last <laughs> correct. Because I saw David Griscom butcher it and I was like, shit. <laughs> I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> it's Cicerchia. It's Italian. So just all the C's are hard C's. I was right. I said it that way, and you said I was wrong. I you was did right. not. You did not say it that way. You said it all effed off. Can yeah. I tell you guys a, a secret though? A lot of Americans actually pronounce it um, Cicertia. So, but I live in Europe now, so I don't allow this anymore because it's embarrassing. Because they they actually can pronounce Italian words, so they say it right in the first place. So I had to crack down on. Are you Sicilian? Are you Sicilian? No, my family, my uh, great grandfather's from Southern Italy. My grandparents. Oh, okay. Yeah. Excellent. Do you know Sicilians, Pascal? Capisci italiano da un poco. A little bit. I was waiting for you. To yeah. Do. Thanks for having me, guys. No, thank you. Thank you for agreeing to come on. Doctor, L- now should we call? Can we call you Doctor L- Lillian? Is that offensive? Is that problematic? <laughs> that no, it, it's beyond. It's it's beyond problematic to being okay. I can nice. be Dr. Lillian. Horse, horseshoe theory is real. Exactly. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's start off with the first. This is the first question that people are going to have, yeah. um, and that is just real quick, as 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 quick as possible. <laughs> this is, it's a long it's a long answer. How would you define post Marxism for those that have never heard the term? Okay. I would say that it's a way for people on the left, like the new left, to adapt to the philosophical and ideological trends of postmodernism. So people probably think about, like, know something about all of these words with post attached to the front, postmodernism, poststructuralism, postcolonialism. Postmarxism is like in the same world, the same generation, the same generations, I guess now plural, the same philosophical trends. Um, And I think it's a way to kind of, it was a kind of way for especially some European philosophers um, of the 80s and 90s to fend off some of the influence in more explicitly anti-Marxist influence of postmodern social philosophy, social theory, and Um, It's a way of saying we're not we're not giving up the game yet and a kind of process of adaptation to that. So it's not like distinct. It's distinctive because it says it has some kind of allegiance to Marxism, whereas like for postmodernists, the primary targets 
are always liberalism and Marxism conjointly. Like these are the previously emancipatory philosophies of the 19th and 20th centuries that we are superseding, going on, going beyond, figuring out why they're inadequate. And um, the post-Marxists basically agree, but they don't want to give up the the game yet. They they are, they're still opposed to capitalism, presumably, and so that's why it's a little tricky. And so it's it's a something of a different conversation as like those other post theories but it's um it is its own little ecosystem jason you mind if i have a follow-up question I, I you i could see you chomping at the bit for a follow-up yeah. now, now now lillian i will say we did do a show with uh professor vivek cheber uh not too long ago about postmodernism. Oh, yeah. um and if, if time would have permitted we would have tried to have you on that show but of course, yeah. the don't kind of ruin that. So, okay, I have an but, idea. I think I have an idea of what Vivek would say about some of this stuff. So I'll try not to repeat his uh, his uh, the ground he's previously laid and try to say something more specific about this little world. So, well, Pascal, are you ready? Because I know you're chomping at the bit. To say something. Yeah, you know, um, we did have Vivek on. I was, you know, I was very, very uh, uh, happy to have Vivek on to talk about post postmodernism, post structuralism, and uh, in terms of context, we talking about the new left. Are you particularly talking about the left that comes out of the 1960s, 1950s to 1960s kind of Frankfurt School, post Frankfurt School kind of, you know, uh, uh, Marcuse uh, type of left? Is that the new left? It's, you're it's in that lineage, but I actually think it's a little farther along the road into the 80s and, and 90s. Um, and I think, because I think what makes it distinctive is its kind of intersection with the fall of the wall and Eurocommunism um, and the beginning of the, the troubles of neoliberalism and the collapse of uh, the traditional orientation of social democratic parties in Europe. So some European theorists um, are trying to grapple with some real realities of like the fragmentation of the working class, the onset of deindustrialization. Um, but I think that like, it's not quite the new left that you're thinking about. It's kind of like people who take some of their suggestions and radicalize them further. So for example, Marcuse would have been somebody who argued that like, um, you know, the working class isn't the subject of history anymore. You know, they're more conservative. So we need students, we need um, the new social movements and so on to be the new revolutionary subjects. So he's a Frankfurt School theorist. And he's a part of the, he's theorizing about the new left, even though he's a little older than they are. Um, the post-Marxists will be people that kind of take insights of people who are already critical of orthodox Marxism a little farther down the road and radicalize them. I want to ask you one question, and I'm going to pivot to Derek Vaughan. How much of this do you think is a consequence, as with Marcuse, of the fact that post-New Deal uh, policy in the United States in the West, the working class through state policy, some would say state capitalism, mm -hmm. becomes, as my friend Paul McCombs would argue, embourgeoisied, if you will. Not necessarily becoming the bourgeoisie, but becomes culturally, uh, uh, de develops cultural affinity for almost kind of like middle class, petit bourgeois lifestyle, quality of life, if you will. I, I understand that these, these terms might be misapplying because they're not actually petit bourgeois because they're still working class. And that how much of these philosophies, I know that in the case of Marcuse, that was pretty much the case, but post-Marxism is about the fact that, for example, you have things in the 70s like Richard Nixon appealing to the hard hats and they're becoming over, over, overly reactionary. Is there a correlation between the rise of the working class being deemed as the reactionary foot soldiers of the Republican Party and these philosophies that that seem to ascribe their lack of revolutionary capacity to their politics. Yeah, so it, I think you're exactly right. It's there is a correlation. Um, I think the correlation is the how you described it is like the background to this is perfect. I would say that these are scholars that seem to think they're so disappointed 
that workers didn't do what they expected them to do. So these are people who are part of a kind of political zeitgeist. They're being educated by members of the new left. You know, they're around people that really had a certain kind of amount of revolutionary faith. They thought we were all going somewhere um, with class politics. But a lot of these people um, were also a part of like the more cultural side to the left. And they were experimenting with different um, ways of living and lifestyles and so on. And then what ends up happening is they get so disappointed by workers. They're in there. How did you say it? The embourgeoisification? Embourgeoisie. Yeah, yeah, they get so disappointed that workers are not um, culturally where they are or that they're not expressing political inf the political interests that they think they should have, that they forsake the idea of class politics as a distinct project altogether. Um, and I think, I do want to say that I think this starts in Europe and then it gets translated back into the U.S. and gets justified retroactively with the kind of um, justifications that you mentioned, because it's also the case that in Europe, you know, workers are uh social democrat democracy has done a lot for working people and people aren't always ready to take the risks to do like something completely else so you have all of these like radical individuals who are a part of left-wing social movements or just cultural milieus um and they they're not they're they think things should be pushing further especially culturally than a lot of the working class appears to be willing to do um they've been betrayed by social democratic parties and so on and so then you get this um kind of reaction to the working class and i think that um that's a really important thing to know it's not just like an objective reading of the search of the situation and you're saying okay the opportunities aren't there right now we need to try other things it's actually like a reaction against workers as the potential subject. And I think in the US, the way that this gets articulated is um, exactly what you said, that workers and the trade unions, they become more bureaucratic, more culturally conservative. They want to own their homes in the suburbs. They want to be middle class. And therefore, there's no hope for these people. Um, and this is something all postmodernists think, but post-Marxists kind of retain an interest in a, le in a revolutionary subject for longer. So students, um, black power, feminism, feminism, LGBT movements, like, and they, they retain an interest in that. And that's kind of distinctive. Whereas postmodernists are just like, they, they don't try to find the new subject. Um, Ron, you want to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, I, there's a lot there. Um, um, post Marxism was sort of dying when I was in university 20 years ago. So it's something that I, kind of know a little bit about and um i find it interesting that it went from europe to the united states although the question of the new revolutionary subject was actually being discussed in maoist groups in the u.s kind of mm -hmm. concurrently but with no um no intellectual backing for it other than just you know ho exploring various nationalisms um the the kind of I guess maybe many consider him right-wing Marxist. Uh, Christopher Lash was writing about this in this in '65. Um, I want to ask you though, because one of the things that it seems specific to the post-Marxist, in as I know them, and I know them mostly from France, um, is like the the one, two, three of '68, Mitterrand, uh, the the communist concessions to neoliberalism, and then the wall falling, like those things together. Um, why uh, why do you think it had why do you think there was any interest in maintaining any relationship to marxism with some of those thinkers because like baudrillard who makes a hard postmodern break it's just you know um and i guess we're more thinking who would you consider uh the primary post-marxist laclau or is that where we're at laclau move rancier um, mm -hmm. It would be a, another big one in France. I did read um, that. Uh, I read some of that book that you suggested, the Laclau move book. Yeah, Hegemony and Socialist Strategy is really the, the defining text of this kind of break with what they call Orthodox Marxism. Um, but, you know, Hart and Negri are another pair that um, wrote Empire and Multitude and a couple other books that are very influential. Um, Deleuze and Guattari are not necessarily like 
post-Marxist, but they're really absorbed cur currently into a milieu of people who no longer really think class politics work and they're more interested in talking about subjectivity under capitalism and you know th these um so there are other people that are probably less central but i would put those people all into the post-marxist camp um you know it's hard to tell why they continue to have a relationship with marxism and i think you can ask this question of post-marxist in this more like francophone tradition and you can also ask it of critical theory um, in the Frank Frankfurt School tradition. Mm -hmm. So these are simultaneous and sometimes connected tracks. Um, these are people who get their theoretical start by thinking about Marxism. And then there's a so-called crisis of Marxism for the historical reasons that you mentioned um, and some ideas that don't seem to be tenable anymore. And you know, you do have to wonder, like, why not just stop talking about Marx? Like, if you disagree with him so much and you think he was so wrong, why don't you just leave him alone? Like, and then leave the rest of us alone. Um, but I mean, it's a well, moment. It's foundation, right? Right. So you need your foundation, but more than that, you need a kind of claim to being radical. And I think that that's where, like, it gets kind of speculative psychologically in the academy. So the kinds of things that, you know, are being subject to more critique on the left recently, which is that people in the academy kind of make themselves the subject of history and so on. Um, I think that, like, for people who had a connection at one point to social movements or like to imagine themselves as having a connection to a movement or a campaign or a any kind of political project that was like real, once that becomes more tenuous, a part of like yourself is very invested in kind of continuing to be the engaged intellectual to kind of try to um, think about things in a transformative way. And sometimes this is very sincere, like not everyone is a cynic, but sometimes it is cynical. Like you, you want to kind of advance your career and then you just use Marxism as like the regular um, stepping stone because you know no one's going to argue with you if you say Marxism is wrong or white or colonial or whatever. Um, and so post-Marxists kind of claim this space where they get to be the inheritors of a tradition um, and it kind of gives them a claim to being connected to a political project that other people are not necessarily connected to any longer in the in the academy and perhaps they don't even care to be well you know i wanted to ask you and i'll shut up pascal i'm gonna i'm gonna be quiet for a lot of the show uh i booked it so just calm down you've been hosting for a while let me say some questions god damn it uh lillian i've watched your uh appearance on the left reckoning show yeah and you had mentioned someone that is a, a favorite author actually of pascal uh, cedric robinson yeah. And black Marxism. <laughs> I did. <laughs> oh, I'm boy. joking. I'm joking because none of us here like that very dense book. <laughs> Would you call uh, Cedric Mar Robinson's Black Marxism a, a post-Marxist uh, book? Because I, I, I heard you you mentioned it in passing, and <laughs> and David didn't really follow up on it. Um, and I'm not going to be mad. I'm not, I'm David. If you watched, I'm not holding this against you. If you didn't read that book, trust me. Y yeah, I would. I think it's, um, I think it's either post Marxist or kind of a, a, a part of the initial bridge from mm -hmm. Marxism to post Marxism. Um, because the, the thesis of the book, I mean, there's many theses going on, but one thesis is simply that, um, workers, um, are not the ones with the radical interest in transforming the world and black people are um, and the kind of undifferentiated undif population of black people that like not only do they have an interest in overthrowing capitalism, they have an interest in kind of overthrowing the foundations of the whole world and actually all of the black Marxists that you um, have known and studied um, within that tradition or have always been exceeding it, gesturing beyond it. And so he kind of leverages people like um, CLR James and Du Bois to, to say, actually, these people never fit into this paradigm. They were always pushing against it, exceeding it. And now we need to transition to this different thing called black radicalism. Okay. Um, now, and so the, that is the precursor, uh, would you say, to Afro pessimism? Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. What do you think, Pascal? Do you think that's true? Um, 
I haven't thought about it like that. I actually think that Afro pessimism plays a lot more off critical race theory than it does off Cedric Robinson's black. I mean, Cedric Robinson is kind of the foundation for a lot of those people, but Fanon, Fanon as well. Well, well, misreadings of Fanon, yes. But I I actually see the logic of where uh, Jason is coming from in that uh, Cedric Robinson kind of uh, uh, intimates the futility of believing in the revolutionary capacity of the white working class, which also kind of creates the foreground to some some of Afro pessimism as well. Afro pessimism as well. So I would not say you're incorrect in in your connectivity there, Jason, at all. I'm just wondering when is James Clyburn going to be putting up the hammer and sickle and getting ready to uh, do the revolution since black people quote unquote are always so radical and revolutionary and uh what i mean what what is when what, when did the uh the mau mau come with obama i mean did i miss the miss the invitation did, well i think it is uh so first of all i just want to say that this is revolution podcast brought to you by black coin presented by spike <laughs> lee everybody once everybody gets their black coin account we can start the revolution but we give white people less black coin of course, they get uh, three fifths of every one. Nation matters. You know what I would say though about Black Marxism is I do think it's really foundational to what I think you guys have talked about in this show before. Um, the kind of long life of both andism. You know, like where we like if we focus on. So, I think the argument in that book is that is it's not against class politics exactly. It's about if we actually focus on the radical subjectivity of black people in America or black people globally, then the pl- class politics will automatically follow. And um, so it's kind of like you can get at class politics in a different direction. So I'm not going to like argue against it exactly, but the attention should now be over here. And I think that that's kind of a complicated um argument that still holds a lot of what I don't know if it's exactly for Afro pessimists, but certainly for the contemporary left um, and some of the common sense that has emerged around like, you know, there's going to be there's a way into black, uh, sorry, to class politics, Mm -hmm. through black politics or through any other social movement, actually, that isn't directly through the class structure or directly through uh, organizing the class. Well, really, you know, for, you know, for someone who, you know, spent several years as a student and i'll say student i'm not a phd in black uh, politics i'm basically a lawyer by training but i've written significant on black politics i read a lot of black political thought um one of the main reasons i have with that postulate that you know black people are the vanguard of the revolution is that number one it never defines what black people are you talking about because it also it's it's class it's racial racially essentialist and it's frankly racist because you believe you're believing that somehow the the physiological reality of having more melanin in a global capitalist system is more likely to be make you revolutionary while not taking into consideration that there are various class structural hierarchies and categories that exist within black communities and for me as someone who was a child of the haitian revolution meaning that my parents are from haiti when i hear these things about how black people are innately revolutionary and i think about how people who were considered heroes like two sailor mature within a week of the beginnings of the haitian revolution were trying to cut deals with the french to basically save their own hides how literally there were people who were less than a decade after the Haitian Revolution, who were also black, who were trying to cut deals with the French to have them re-recognize Haiti. This notion, and this, by the way, is considered to be the epitome of the most radical or revolutionary activity that has happened amongst black people in the Western Hemisphere from the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, and maybe to some, in some people's opinion, to, 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 to today. So this notion somehow that black people are essentially revolutionary to me is profoundly a historical and also takes into this this notion that somehow black people don't have class stratification amongst themselves and what's even more amazing to me about people who make these postulates who read things like you read that into books like black marxism or extrapolate that from fanon is that one of the things that fanon warned about fanon warned about Amilcar Cabral warned about, Kwame Nkrumah warned about, 
was the rise of the neo-colonial bourgeoisie or what's known as the comfort or bourgeoisie in that the belief that if you think you're going to be liberated just by having black leaders in these capitalist uh, uh, structures govern you, you're wrong because they're going to betray the revolution or the radical implement uh, implementation of that once they get into positions of power. You know, I was having a really interesting uh, uh, email discussion with Adolf Reed about that. And the question I asked him is that, is, does it obscure more than illuminate to make the analogy between the comparator bourgeoisie or the uh, neocolonial bourgeoisie and the black American political class? And he said something that was very interesting to me. He said that, he said, I think it obscures more than illuminates. And he, he, he got me thinking about even that framing. And he said something that's fascinating. He said, why would you assume in the first place that the comparador bourgeoisie would have any more allegiance to the black proletariat than any bourgeoisie has to the proletariat anywhere? The whole formulation assumes that racial kinship creates an, an, an allegiance between black people who are under normal circumstances, like in any Western country, would normally be antagonistic. In other words, when we think about it in the American mm -hmm. context, we don't think about the comfort or bourgeoisie. We realize that the bourgeoisie are innately the class enemies of the proletariat. So why is it that in post-colonial African diasporic analysis, these class actors who are working at behest of capital are considered comprador, are considered compradors or neocolonial. And if you think about it, the only reason you think they are compradors or neocolonial as petite bourgeoisie or bourgeoisie is that you assume that their racial makeup would give them a natural allegiance. And I didn't think about that until I was having that email exchange with with the. Uh, with, with Adolf, and I was like, you know, that's actually correct. And that's when you know, and Adolf has also said why he doesn't like the term black misleadership class. And I've always questioned that, and he made that clear on the show. He said, because if you call them black misleadership class, that assumes that you think that there's a class of black people who are inherently going to be good leaders. The problem is that you believe that there's going to be a leader who's black who's going to save you in the first place. You shouldn't believe that a leader, black, white, or otherwise, is going to save you because once they have a position of power, they're probably going to betray you, whether they are black, white, or anything. You know, I, I think um, that the way that this sort of connects to the conversation about post Marxism and why it. So here's another way of framing it these people are so skeptical that workers are going to form the group, be the revolutionary subject. Why does it hap so happen that they're actually never as skeptical of any other group being able to be that subject? So, um, you know, when you lay it out like that, Pascal, it's obvious in a certain sense that like, if you don't look at things through a preconceived racial lens and you actually think, what are the pressures people are under? What are their incentives? How do they think about their interests? What are their material interests as well as how they perceive them? Then if you actually think, that black people or women or whoever are actually just regular people like everyone else, then you should be able to reach some uh, good, you know, conclude, like make some good analysis of how it is that these class structures emerge and who it benefits and who it doesn't and so on. But if you have a preconceived idea of what someone's um, interests are, then you can't make that analysis. So you have to constantly save the phenomena by like, um, of the possible solidarity by obscuring um, the class structure. And I think the reason that this happens is actually that like the whole postmodern part post Marxist wave is a rejection of the idea that material interests matter at all. Mm -hmm. Everything is just discourse and subjectivity. We're always just reconstructing our, our subjects. We're always fragmented. We're always, you know, in some sense, we're all just in a, in a conglomeration of different influences and identities. Um, and so that's what kind of matters to make sense of it. But what's interesting is that they forget about that the kind of racial reasoning just like lingers underneath the surface because they don't act, they actually do assume that all black people have the same interests at the same time that they're like, they're saying, you know, vacuous things like race is a social construction or, you know, black people are not a monolith. All of this is happening at the same time that this assumption is still being transposed onto the, the framework. Um, and it's not interrogated because they've all already decided that material interests don't matter 
anyway. So the same racial assumptions just get to continue to reappear without being, you know, the question being asked in most um, in most circles, even though they, they've done such a good job of showing why the working class doesn't necessarily have the same interests, which is, you know, the whole argument in the first like decade in which this was was popular. What's also interesting, and I, I, I don't mean to, to, to take up, to, is that why do we assume that the same social cultural phenomenon or even economic that cause the increased conservatism of the white working class affect the black working class in the same way. We don't think that 50 years of black capitalism, uh, black popular culture being a, a gateway to uh, conservative ideology, racial, uh, um, um, respectability politics, uh, prosperity ministries in the black church. We don't think that that has an ideological echo chamber in a way that causes an increasing conservative amongst working class black people. Really? Jason, I'd like Jason to jump in and actually give his two cents on that phenomenon. Or Marcus. Well, I, I, the only thing I've, I've got is that it's even like a... Especially when you talk about the Democrats, like that even um, the the guess that, you know, more black people, more people of color equals more patronage for the Democratic Party is something that they're like completely failed at, especially when it comes to Latinos. And, uh, you know, like you just go back to Trump and more so than the black community having inroads. And there's that kind of like failed assumption that, uh, oh, yeah, since you're, you know, a, a, a minority, you know, or, you know, a person of color, if you're not allowed to use that term anymore, um, <laughs> then then you will automatically be uh, be a Democrat, you know, completely ignoring that people is going to do people are going to do what they think is in their best interest. But um, uh, Lauren, I know you had something as well. Uh, I was going to pick up on the fact that uh, Dr. Lillian has been kind of hinting that this has become general left common sense. And I wanted to maybe um, talk about Hart and Negri's um, uh, Empire and Multitude books, because um, in 1999, Empire was on the bestseller list. It was a post-structuralist, post-Marxist text that people were reading who were into the New York times. And I mean, Nigri's own history is very interesting, but the, the whole strategy around occupy around like coalitions of oppressed peoples and oppressed groups, um, black, queer, uh, women, um, you can add to it. I mean, it was, it was literally the multitude of oppressed groups, any way to get into this, but class, um, was, was sort of defining at the end of the 90s and i would say all the way up through occupy like it it was not and it was remarkably popular in a way that it's hard to even remember how popular it was 20 years ago like it's shocking that you know an italian uh, an italian french uh text like that would would sell that well um particularly because it was not necessarily easily written it was not meant to be accessible so um why do you think it was uh, this kind of post-Marxism was useful for a kind of left? Uh, I would see it as recuperation, but but I'm putting words in people's mouths if I say that. So um, a kind of a strategy for a broad left after the fall of the, the Soviet Union. Well, I think because it embraces political pluralism, you know, like the, the kind of hallmark of, of liberal social science under capitalism is that we are all in hypothetically many interest groups um, and citizens get together and they try to influence the state they try to influence policy um, and the reason that this is structurally possible is that the state is neutral you know the state is not partial to any particular class or group um, in a liberal society and therefore um, we, we should all like that, you know, and that's how you get phrases like the marketplace of ideas and um, and stuff like that. Um, I think that after the fall of the Soviet Union. So, OK, let me start back up. 
first of all, most of the post-Marxist stuff like Le Clown and Mouffe, that is basically just liberal pluralism. It's kind of adapting to um, the kind of emerging world of NGOs and universities and foundations that are kind of willing to um, fund or organize um, community services and sort of different um, cultural formations and so on. And then there's also, so, and so this is the kind of where this is all going. It's like a radical veneer on liberal interest group pluralism. And then by the time, you know, the year 2000 comes around, there's, or 1999, and there's these protests against um, so-called globalization, um, you have this kind of ready-made pluralism and you know people there's a there's an expression of a mass of people that are angry and upset and um the idea of a, of a multitude of just kind of different coalitions building i think people were like aha there's something happening now and we don't need to go back to those old stodgy and vulgar ideas about the economy and class we just need to like stitch together the right set, you know coalition um, and I think that was basically the attractiveness of, of something like that, because it's it's just trying to make sense of a moment, a, a moment of hope that people who had genuine left wing affinities had and clearly some left liberals. Um, yeah, that's how I would just make sense of where that book was um, interesting, why it was interesting to people. I mean, I, the question I want to ask, though, is that what is and I, I, I what is the utility of this analysis to the contemporary phenomenon that considers itself a left? Notice I didn't call them a left. I said the contemporary phenomenon that considers itself a left. And how do we make this analysis valuable to working class people? black, brown, white, and otherwise, and get them to think outside of these factions that the ruling class has created for them. So, sorry, which, you're asking about how is which analysis useful to working people? The understanding, of the, the understanding of the legacy of post Marxism oh. in terms of how how is this, what is the contemporary value that we have in understanding that for today's left, if you will, and how can we make that analysis valuable or important to those people who are suffering the worst vicissitudes of capitalism that we still believe we have to organize to challenge the system. You say you're saying there's value in post-Marxism, Pascal? No, no, and the critique that she's leveraging of it, the critique. Now, how do we make this critique? How do we, value? How do we implement? In other words, how do we get walking papers from this analysis and make it <laughs> utilize it for a current left and in, in our organizing spaces amongst white working class folk as well? Like, how do we make this practically valuable? There was something interesting that you said, Lillian, uh, on another show where you talked about how a lot of these guys all come from the academy. Right. And they're the ones that are going to be bestowing the knowledge upon the, the, the proletariat, if you will. So they're kind of in control of everything. Right. So I think the easiest way to answer this question is to say, like, that this is not useful to working people. And if you're actually interested in organizing them, and you know, I'm an academic, so I'm not going to tell everybody exactly what they should be, how they should be spending their political time. But I'm, you know, um, of the opinion, like I think an emerging cohort of people that were influenced by the Bernie campaign, that like the thing that needs to be done is class reformation and to have a left that's actually in communication or attached in some way to the the working class and if that's true then there's a couple of things that are just going to become irrelevant right away and that if you're actually having a political political dialogue with somebody who's not just interested in ideas for their own sake um that you know it will become clear so like um i'd say the four things that post-marxism is interested in is they're obsessed with subjectivity Okay, so they're obsessed with their own identities and as well as as well as like just theoretically how subjects in the world are formed. They are skeptical of material interests. Um, they do not have any concrete policy or policy programs or structural goals because they're mostly interested in cultural hegemony um, and they're into political pluralism. So if you're talk, if you're interested in organizing working people or in a working class community, I assume that just the act of actually doing something that people do see is in their material interests, um, that you actually do have a policy platform 
um, that you're not, you know, you may have some coalitions, but you're not, um, you're partisan in the sense that I, I you want to help poor people, working people, and we need to change the society accordingly. Um, a lot of this navel gazing about like, who are we? And like, um, you know, how do we not, you know, do all of the bad things that the vulgar Marxists do? Like, I just assume that, um, if you're actually invested in doing anything concrete, that some of these ideas will just become sort of ridiculous. But I think that the, there's a there's a hurdle that needs to be, I'm not sure exactly sure how, how to do that. Um, so I don't know if that answers the, the, the practical question. I think I'm, my instinct is to just kind of say, just help ignore it, but um, <laughs> like people should be, be aware of, of these ideas. Um, I think it's a different question of like if you're in DSA or some organizing mm -hmm. environment and like you're talking about these kinds of things and somebody who's not in this academic world shows up, that's going to be very alienating. So the first thing you should probably do is just stop because I don't know why anybody would mm -hmm. um, take that except for yeah, the, the, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. More polemical bit, but I, I genuinely think these are ideas for people who want to see themselves as politically active when they are, in fact, not. And I assume that if they were to become politically active, you'd have to kind of change your mind a little bit because you'd have to realize that other people don't think that material interests are vulgar, you know? Mm. So you're giving the audience the free, your endorsement. That if someone starts bringing up post Marxism, you could just say, shut up, nerd. And then <laughs> get back to work. Yeah. Say, 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 save it for the bar after, afterward, or not at all, preferably, but if you must. I was not a fan of what I didn't finish the book last night, but I was not a fan of what I read because it was a lot of word salads that kind of didn't say much to me. And it does. It, I, and you brought this up. I also listened to your your show you did on it, uh, which I I don't think I sent to Pascal last night. But what was it called? Uh, why I hate class and love Derrida. Oh yeah, why we learn to hate class and love Derrida. Yeah. <laughs> which to me, I, I thought summed up uh, a lot of that uh, reading in a nutshell. I do want to uh, address this super chat with the panel. Uh, do y'all think that black power politics ever had a chance to be revolutionary, especially since it had the tendency to paper over class divisions? Ooh, loaded question like this. <laughs> <laughs> Answer it wrong. Like lo loaded, loaded question. And I'm like, give me the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Well, I would suggest uh, let's, let's let Jason answer. I like Jason's opinion. Have you have you ever read? Uh, I would I would suggest reading Cedric Robin. I almost said Johnson. Cedric Robinson's from Cedric Johnson. Cedric Johnson. Which Cedric did I say? You said Robinson. You almost God said damn it. Sorry. I, don't, I hope Ced ain't watching. I don't want to hear him yelling at me about it. Uh, Cedric Johnson's from Revolutionaries to Race Leaders, which really answers this question in about uh, two hundred and ninety pages. But uh, no, I don't really think those politics ever had a chance to be truly revolutionary. I do think there's a little bit of th that you can get from those politics. But at the end of the day, what did they really get us? Pascal had a line that when the, early on, before he was a co-host, he said that resonated. And, and it, it reminds me of uh, what you said about hip hop, about uh, black power politics. You remember that? No, which it one is with the boy when we were talking about boys in the hood? What was the line about uh, uh, the basically black culture, black pop culture? Yeah, and and black and black power politics. Oh, I, I don't remember. You have to remind <laughs> me. That was like a year ago. But no, no, I I don't I don't really think they are revolutionary um, because of the tendency to paper over class divisions and. The need to be race first. Uh, uh, Marcus, do you have thoughts? I'd like to hear your opinions. Um, I mean, I, I think, yeah. I mean, short answer, no. You know, and then like, as like, why? You know, it says like, I think Jason makes a good point of like, what do these things actually get us? You know, but like, I'd say the result of a revolutionary action is not necessarily the, you know, the question like whether it's revolutionary or not. So it comes to things of like, 
are there a lot of actions that can come out of like any movement and like those actions can be you know revolutionary and simplified just like outside of like the main structures of uh society um yes will you know i mean i think that's largely like a one of the backbones of every one of the conversations that i have with jason and pascal is that you know this the, the idea of black power will not you know save black people or you know <laughs> definitely like the proletariat as a whole and i mean a lot of the conversation that we had today kind of points to as to why so well, i want to hear what derek has to say <laughs> um Derek is a reader of Harold Cruz, who is a prominent yeah, first figure. First time invited me on the show was to have a debate about it's Harold about Cruz. Cruz. Yeah. 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 I was like, in that, in that book as well. I was like, Vaughn, you read Harold Cruz? He was like, yeah. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he pulls out the book out of his back pocket. He's like, who hasn't? Uh, well, yeah, who hasn't? Um, so the... I, the, the one thing I would say is black power politics is emblematic of a lot of these kinds of political movements. And I think post-Marxism is an interesting gloss. It's interesting to think that it was a product of the 80s and 90s and not the 60s and 70s, which is really what it's its main. Like the, the talking points that it's making in obscure ways were already made mm -hmm. in the 60s and 70s. Um, I, I think it I think it was kind of a dead end and instantly recuperable. And I don't just mean that in the terms of like, you know, everybody like Ranciere and Laclau and even like Javois Ejek kind of broke out into the scene. I mean, we forget this attacking Laclau. That's kind of um academically where you started seeing ac people being interested in actual Marxism again. And I I, I you can tell with the actual how I actually feel about post-Marxism. But I, I will say that we need to, that yes, we need to dismiss the nerds, but I do think, <laughs> um, I, I do think it is the, the standing operated procedure of a whole lot of the, of the left, particularly the NGO left, um, which we could, you know, call them whatever we want to, maybe they're not really left, but, um, and the other thing I'd say, we haven't brought him up, but, uh, the, the third generation of the Frankfurt school, you know, um, Habermas and whatnot, they became kind of the crown prince philosophers of the European Union, um, which is if you're if you want any relationship to Marxism and you're all of a sudden justifying the EU, it's, it's real hard to see what revolutionary core still in there. Um, so uh, I would say well, I have to be careful. I'll yeah. try not to advertise this too much to my European followers on Twitter in case the European liberals get mad at me for. Being on an anti-EU podcast. <laughs> I'm just um, um, but I do, I do think that's we, we've seen kind of where this is going. But I also think it's. It, I, I don't think this idea is going to just go away just because the post-Marxism is no longer in vogue. Like I think it's going to come back and keep coming back. Well, well I wanna... I think it's oh, going to oh. keep coming back. It'll still. I mean, I think. You know, I, I said it was the 80s and 90s because I feel like these are some of the, the, this is like really when the new left, they had already gotten their PhDs, they were writing their books. Um, and so that's kind of why the, the, I located it in those uh, decades. But I think you're right. Like the reason that this was so readily, um, readily spiraled in that direction was because the new left, the movements of the 60s were already making these kinds of criticisms um, of Marxism. And, you know, to be fair, I think I, you know, I'm being kind of polemical usually when I talk about this stuff, but there are some substantive issues here. Like they, Orthodox Marxism tended to be, you know, technological determinist. They thought that the more the productive forces of, you know, capitalism evolved, the more it would bring workers together and the more the revolu revolutionary potential would happen. If you live in like 1912, this isn't crazy. It feels like it's ha that's what's happening. Um, and that's what they predicted and they were wrong. Um, and so there's a several generations of disillusionment. Um, and basically what happens is like the wrong conclusions get radicalized. Like there is another way to talk about, um, to be a materialist, to have sociological analyses that don't essentialize people, that don't assume interests, that think about constraints. You can do all of this within a Marxian framework. It's just that that wasn't what was in vogue. And so it got pushed into these other um other directions and i agree that it's not going anywhere because post-structuralism post-modernism they have literally broken 
our our brains. Like we have we have experienced a long decline in ability to think about social structure, to see the difference between like political um, strategies and just other kinds of theoretical conversations. Um, and that's a product of, of all of this. Like if you can't, if you can't figure out that your meta theoretical framework in the background is not the same thing as a political strategy because you haven't been think taught to think politically, that's a huge problem. And that's something that this generation of people kind of bequeathed to us. And so it's not, it's definitely not going away because it's no longer in vogue. In fact, what I see is people trying to learn to think about structure again and actually falling back on the same stuff that was wrong. Like, why are we still talking about like multiple systems theory? Or why are we still talking about like the same stuff that the new left was talking about with who is the political subject? You know, these kind of recapitulating these debates about black power that Cedric Johnson analyzed so um well in that book and I think convincingly um we're doing it all again because we are not we haven't actually like confronted that maybe we need to like stop following this particular train of thought. Well, well, well why do you think there is a fetishization sorry <laughs> of if we, if we want to talk about black power there's definitely a fetishizing of that era as if it was the revolutionary era, end all be all. Why do you think that is? And I, and I ask this question to, to every, here, let me change the screen so you know. I'm asking this question to everybody on the panel. Why do you think that is? I'd like to answer. Yeah, I, I, well, I want to answer directly when someone says, do I think black power had more evolutionary capacity? I said the main reason why I don't believe it is doesn't ask a simple question. Which blacks are going to have the power? Because one of the direct consequences of, the, of black power is that we have the development of the black political class. And one of the reasons why I didn't think it had revolutionary capacity is that it never reckoned with the reality that there are internal class stratifications that exist within the black community. And that when, even within itself, i.e. through the Black National Convention of 1972, those blacks who were more proximate to the ruling class and able to use their political power to leverage and enable to and, and enable themselves to gain the political higher up reflected their class politic political interests and and, and also like this, this conversation this conversation is something like pascal was talking about the 72 gary convention we're still having the 72 gary convention conversation 50 years later when ice cube is taking up that much of the media sphere going well what are you going to do we we need to have a black block of, of votes I'm like okay we need to have a black agenda what is the black agenda why does does robert smith who is worth 3.4 billion dollars maybe more who is black supposed to have the same black agenda as a black person who's a fry cook at mcdonald's because they're both black. Because they're both down, brother. You because ain't gonna know what's up. Um, and, 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 and which which position are more black people closer to? Robert Smith, who's the billionaire, or the black person who's the fry cook at McDonald's? And next question: guess whose interests the black agenda are more likely to reflect? The fry cook at McDonald's? Or Robert Smith, the black billionaire. That's and that's something that like I I find I I mean just uh, it makes me crazy thinking about how like there's this messaging of yeah you know you have the 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 black uh, politics or you know this is this is what we're doing for for Black America X Y and Z and and you put in front you know like Joe Biden. We're like even by the metrics, right? So if everyone says like comes and says like, "Oh, hey, you know, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm for black people." What's one of the first things you go to? Criminal justice reform, you know, like, or, or you know, yeah, reparations if they want to go that far. Um, but I mean, like, crim criminal justice reform, especially within the Democratic Party, is kind of like that that fucking go to. Oh yeah, there's lots of black guys in prison. We let you all smoke some weed. It's cool. We down. Roll the blunts, right? But in even at just the face value, it's like when you put up Joe Biden, you know, who puts up the institution of mass incarceration, it's kind of like this wild thing where even like the rhetoric is just so fake because like they can just throw something right in your face. But somehow, because he chooses Kamala Harris, 
Chucks and Pearls, you know, don't mind the, you know, don't mind the DA record. I, you know, and like, I don't know. It's just so in blatant and in your face that the, this whole like black agenda is, it's fake. It's well, just all fake. Adding on to the black agenda. I, I do want to say before, before we add on to the black agenda, thank you very much. Dr. Thank Lillian, you. tell us where we can find you. I really appreciated you joining our, our podcast and uh, illuminating the facts of post-Marxism to us. I think it was very, very valuable. And uh, please share where we can find your work. We can find you on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at L Search and um, my podcast that I do with my my Left of Philosophy crew is at Left of Phil. So you should follow us. Is and a studio um, show is that an in studio show? No, we recorded ahead of time. We've we're thinking about doing some live stuff, but um, yeah, so far you, we are you guys we, all in the same room though. Um. Oh no, we're on Zoom. We record it. Oh, okay. Well, it just it sounds really good. It sounds like you guys are all in the same room. I heard it was like, oh, I'm gonna tell one of the guys on the podcast guild does that and he will be very glad happy to hear it. Well Spends he's a lot doing of time. a great job with the with the sound. <laughs> um, um I actually thought maybe before I go, I have um maybe an intro an answer to the first question that Jason asked about Afro pessimism. Um uh -oh. I didn't quite I didn't quite stitch it together at the time, but I think that like if part of the project of um like the kind of post-marxist wave is to try to find the new revolutionary subject and fails to do that um something that like is important about black nationalist politics um is like that black people are the can 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 form that kind of subject and then it's kind of like if you realize that's not going to be politically um cohesive and you can't develop a forward-looking project in that direction and you realize it's not possible but you also think that the working class is essentially reactionary and it's not possible to have any kind of political subject then yeah you are going to become pretty pessimistic like politics <laughs> becomes not, yeah I mean politics becomes not possible and I know that you know there's some very attempts to theorize that systematically but um it would make sense to me it, it would follow you know even though i think it's kind of a different thing than post-marxism well before i bring in our next guest i do want to ask our other guests derek and lillian if you guys want to stick around for a hot minute because we are definitely going to take a little bit of a turn in the conversation from post-marxism to a question that has caused several off and on air fights <laughs> with my co-host um and and uh this is the man that's going to resolve this debate he is a, a, a music journalist he is one of the founders of the black rock coalition which you know gave me courage to pick up a guitar some years ago formed the band burnt sugar he is mr greg tate greg tate in the house greg here to muddy the waters and confuse the issues once again <laughs> <laughs> So I have to ask this question, and everybody on the panel is free to be a part of this conversation. Like we said, this is a community that we're trying to form here. Pascal does not believe that Earth, Wind, and Fire is indeed Black Yacht Rock. Oh, Black it's a sacrilegious to even say that. But Black Yacht Rock, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Earth, Wind, and Fire, Frankie Beverly. Yacht Rock, what kind of yacht, yacht Rock? For, for, yeah, I mean, the only, the, only, the only black people I know that have yachts are, are like uh, rappers who get them rented for videos. For <laughs> and which is exactly what I said. And and now my good friend, Mr. Lukeman Brown, his dad used to uh, enter him in yacht races with like uh, Yale prep school boys and he used to kick their ass when he was like about 16. Then he discovered punk rock and he abandoned all of that. <laughs> um, so you know we are, we are, we 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 are a people of uh of many pieces many segments 
because uh, Earth, Wind, and Fire, now Earth, Wind, and Fire, I knew, mm -hmm. was uh, the band that kind of leapt on the scene um, with the album Last Days in Time in 1972. And then went on, they did, uh, uh, what was the album after that? Uh, Keep Your Head to the Sky. And then, um, oh man, the album that had a Mighty Mighty Kalimba song, you know, and they just continued to, uh, you know, they were put, they were part of the funk, the funk self-contained funk band movement that included uh, War, Parliament Funkadelic, Shaka Khan and Rufus, Mandrill, so forth and so on. Um, yeah, Jason, so, Jason is trying to so say I, that so, Earth, Wind, Earth, Wind and Fire is dent is elevator music for dentist office. Well, I shit, wouldn't um, say all that at this. Well, I mean, but. You know, the whole thing is like actually when the firm, uh, the company Muzak went out of business, like Blue Note Records actually leaped into the void. So now the elevator music of today in and I, I, heard, I heard Blue Note Records being played in the hotel elevators in Denver, Colorado last mm -hmm. time I was out there. So um, the thing is, black culture just tends to have incredible longevity in the public sphere, you know. So um, we make the music that lasts and it becomes definitive and it starts at the margins. It starts in, in like, you know, sit sometimes the gutter of America, like the blues did. And next time, next thing, you know, I go to uh, Radio City to see an all blues concert and the, the, the acts are mostly black and the, the audience, the capacity audience is mostly white, you know. I mean, can we help it that we're so fly? <laughs> I, don't I don't know. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, it's, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, with Burn Sugar, we travel all over the world. Everywhere I go, we're already there. You know, hotel. I mean, if I go to Paris and Italy, man, I'm, I'm not, I'm not hearing, um, Debussy and Puccini. In the restaurants, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the elevators, the hotels, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm hearing, I'm hearing Earth, Wind and Fire, you know what I mean? I'm hearing Al Green. I'm hearing like Louis Armstrong, Miles Davis, and Jackie McLean, you know, like, you know, because what we represent in sound, and I mean, and, and in other aspects of performative, expressive culture is modernity. You know, you want to sound like today, then Black music is gonna be your your pimp theme song, you know. <laughs> Greg, I want to ask you a question on that. All right, one of the themes yeah. that we have on this show is called the fifty year counter revolution. What that the premise of that theory is that basically, from the assassination of Martin Luther King to today, the politics of American and Western society overall has been a counter revolution against the new left and the politics of the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition and everything that came out of that. So that's where we get the theme, the 50-year counter-revolution. One of the things that we well, talk about... What do you say? Oh, oh. No, no, go, go ahead. Finish, finish your thought. One of the things that we talk about, about the 50-year counter-revolution, and, and knowing that you are an enthusiast and scholar of Black popular cultural creation, is how the American ruling class sub, sub, you know, use Black popular production as a tool of social engineering of black political and social behavior, particularly after the riots coming out of the current, current commission. My question is to you as, as an enthusiast of black popular culture mm -hmm. and musical creation, how do you reconcile the obvious value and importance of black popular culture and its historical nefarious utility by elements of the American ruling class for social engineering engineering purposes i.e how jazz was used in the cold war to expose to ex to expound american capitalism to the developing world how do you make how do you reconcile that analysis if you will uh let's go back to the 1930s let's go back to the new deal let's go back to why um there's a five-day work week and there's no more child labor and there's uh unemployment insurance and uh all these other ideas of the uh the revolutionary the radical left 
of that time that got assimilated by the capitalists to save capitalism from um, um, insurre working class insurrection at that time. You know, I mean, I think the thing is that under the thing about the thing about capitalism is that it works at warp speed it's anarchic you know and it's very much about self-preservation and if once uh you know the capitalists saw the the, the threat of the bolsheviks they sent money to Tol tolstoy i mean tolstoy <laughs> trotsky and Lenin. Mm -hmm. you know what i mean um because uh the the czar didn't want to join the international banking system you know but because they needed to figure out how to pay the army you know like uh the the the, the J, jp morgans and rockefellers and those folks showed up with the with the cash because they knew the threat of um of uh the bolshevik revolution to their own interests you know worldwide so i put what black people have can have contributed in terms of our radical um popular uh popular uh music but popular culture in that category of things that do get swiftly assimilated you know but it's also swiftly assimilated in the context where black people have their american dreams you know what i mean where we have an aspirational culture it was like um i have a, a brother-in-law very well-known uh marxist scholar uh mr tony Bowles. you know um he's married to my sister Drew Augusto, and when um, Barack Obama was running for president the first time, he was amazed that so many Black Americans were so invested in uh, a Black man becoming president of uh, what Kathleen Cleaver calls the United Snakes of America. <laughs> and my sister, just, she just straightened him out. She just said, like, you have to understand that for Black Americans, the most important thing is inclusion. Right? Ooh. So, um and of course let's you know let's let's not downplay the the fact that when we talk about um a radical black culture radical black agenda radical black activists and so forth um you know i mean we're talking about a minority of our community or we're talking about people who are specialists in that you know because if if i've learned nothing from being um in harlem for for 35 years is that um what my neighbors are most concerned with um unlike myself you know who reads the, <laughs> who follows you know four or five newspapers a day um it's about you know uh surviving the journey from working back picking up their kids and you know hopefully being able to spend some time with them on the weekend you know survival you know um under the system you know what I mean? So there, there, and there are times when the movement um, can articulate itself in a way um, towards real specific goals that people can get their heads around and and support. You know, but a lot of what we do to most folks is very arcane and esoteric. You know, and in some ways, the people who have been the best translators of that to kind of mass black culture you know have been you know our artists our nina simones our curtis mayfields our you know james brown for a lick you know but earth wind and fire was part of that p funk's part of that you know um you know these are folks who've been able to you know i mean you know of course all the way up to you know public enemy and chaos one other folks in hip-hop we want to talk about um but we gotta we it's like in these conversations we don't respect enough that we're talking to ourselves <laughs> and we talk to the other we ain't talking we we it's like the other 40 40 to 50 million folks you know that 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 um are are who we who we mean when we say our people mm -hmm. you know like it's it's a deaf ear man i you know I what do i mean and, and let me just say this, you know, it was like, I, it was like, I, 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 I was not, I don't know that I've been as surprised by anything from the right wing ever than that they saw something called critical race theory 
as a threat because <laughs> I got about four I got about four books called Critical Race Theory on my shelf and it's like I got to decide if I got time to read a chapter you know what I mean <laughs> because it's like I thought I was a smart dude but I was like damn I need to decipher this shit you know what I mean so <laughs> So, you know, it was like, mm, I know vaguely what they're talking about there from it's a the symbiotic post, post-structuralist perspective. But, you know, yeah, I mean, and um, yeah, man, it's, you know, it's it's like, I mean, we got to it's like if you're a black intellectual at this point in time, you know, you kind of got to laugh at us as a, a class within a class, you know, um, in terms of our sense of. uh self-importance and, and 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 relevance you know like i mean we're part of a lineage you know what i mean like you know prince hall uh you know denmark vasey and martin delaney and, you know like frederick douglas sojourner truth i mean you know harriet you know i mean you know this black intellectual tradition is kind of built on what these 19th century pioneers did in terms of responding to the crit, you know, the 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 critical demands of the movement for justice in that time, you know. Um, but you know, things have become, uh, you know, quite 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 diversified and fragmented since then, in terms of agendas. Yeah, I'll just say that. The, someone says the revolution will be commodified. I, I definitely. <laughs> uh... Agreed. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it, it's funny, man, because, you know, like I listen to that to, you know, to Gil's piece now mm-hmm. with a different sense of uh, his his satire, you know, because I realized like oh, what he's really saying is there ain't going to be no revolution because we into all of this commercial shit now. <laughs> At the time, it was like that. It was like black people were like you know um like knew all the references that he was making you know like in the negative about you know what was not gonna happen because that was what was happening that was where we were by the time you know he made that in the 1970s like yeah we were we was caught up in american um commerce and and tv culture you know and commodification as anybody you know it's like our consciousness had already been commodified you know, even before you get to the the appropriation aspect, it was like just the fact that we all had all that garbage in his, in our heads that we knew what Gil was referring to. You know, is a song. Think was, is, is a song. Like the revolution. Would, I'm sorry. I'm what's sorry. that? No, I was gonna yeah, say, go is ahead, a song like the revolution? And, and I'm asking this question to you, Mr. Tate, mm-hmm. and the whole panel. Yeah. Is a song yeah. like uh, Gil Scott Heron's uh, "The Revolution Will Not Be Televised"? Maybe the anthem of the defeat of the new left. Um, well, I, I mean, I think Gil made it explicit like a few years later when he made um, uh, Winter in America, you know, said, mm. you know, all, all, all the, um, uh, you know, democracy's ragtime on the corner and all the healers have been killed, you know, mm. like he recognized by the time you got to mid 70s and Nina Simone, you know, spoke on this as well. She's just like somebody asked her, uh, you know, um, what's the state of the civil rights movement? She said they're all dead. You know, all my all my all my friends in the movement are dead, you know, who created that movement are dead, you know, you know. So um but you know, um because um Well do we see a do we see a shift then in the music then? Because if you think let's let's go back okay to that era of the of the sixties, the, the mid to late sixties. And after yeah. 68, which Pascal uh, loves to call the, the beginnings of the 50 plus year counter revolution, right? The 53 year <laughs> counter revolution. Does the music, especially in the black music world, does it make a shift? Because also the mid 70s, we have disco, funk, as much as I'm a fan of it. Yeah, it well, I mean, you know, I mean, look, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I think that. Um, I think what brother's calling a a counter revolution is really it's co and tell pro. <laughs> you know, it was the it was the like we we that that a revolution happened in America on April fourth, nineteen sixty eight. I mean, I think it was a hundred cities went into flames, you know, and, and after that, 
you know, Richard Nixon decided, um, um, well, we better put some money in the hands of these black middle class people and then exterminate these radicals, you know. So but in musical terms, like, I mean, we we kind of we we got even bolder. You know, it's like after James Brown had proved the point with uh, Say It Loud that, you know, you could be that militant and still be on the radio, man. And, you know, Gamble and Huff started filling but in the then, national. But what happens to James Brown, right? James Brown, the man that owned not just uh, pressing plants and recording studios, also owned radio stations. And uh, what, what's what's the line that uh, uh, I can't remember, was the Spiro T. Agnew said? I can't remember who it was that said a man that can stop a riot can start a riot yeah yeah which you know which echoes um you know the thing um you know about what happened when when uh what the police captain said in harlem when malcolm you know got all those folks to go to the station and then just with a gesture got everybody to turn around and go home you know but i mean you know and it all kind of culminates in you know hoover talking about um mm. you know we you know stopping the rise of another black messiah and to the extent that his paranoid, insane ass, you know, became obsessed with anybody who had uh, charismatic powers. I mean, Jimi Hendrix, by the time he died, had a 2000 page FBI file, you know, mm. um, so did Jim Morrison and, and uh, Janis Joplin, you know, and we know what happened to all three of them, yeah. you know what I mean? But, um, but you know, I mean, in within the within the culture, I mean, people, you know, I mean, as to quote Car uh, Curtis, kept on pushing. You know, he kept making, you know, powerful music, um, and we moved, you know, and and we were able to um, take advantage of that opening, which is, you know, um, was kind of the the uh, the precedent setting cycle for where we are now in the sense of uh when 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 um folks threaten uh private property when black folks threaten private property you know suddenly money flows like the heavens you know from from the uh from the ruling class you know it's like a friend of mine's got a uh tulani davis the writer you know like she half jokingly says george floyd is mighty because of all the the dollars you know that have flown to you know to various uh black institutions in the last last year and a half you know or the appointments that have been made or you know i i, I just say that you know anytime black folks break 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 a, a store window in baltimore um about five black writers are going are gonna to receive like major major literary awards that year. You know, they it's like we we move we move to the head of the class you know? <laughs> it's like I mean, and, and you know, I mean, and and it's just blatant. I mean, you just see, like, man, people that they wouldn't even be thinking about. They say, "Oh, there's a negro. Oh, wait a minute, there's a negro back there. Move her up, move him up." You know? uh, and um, I mean, oh, it was a, I mean, look, I, look, a, a friend of mine who who's running a very small um, art art institution in Chicago. She's the head of the Guggenheim now, man. You know what I mean? Hmm. It was like, yeah, I mean, that 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 fear and guilt reflex. Um, in in uh at the top tier white america oh it's it's real i mean the people who are the most insulated are the people who react the first to like get get some black people in here so that like you know our our uh our building don't get burned down and shit, you know what i mean like they you know it's like for you know it's, it's that weird thing you know what i mean it's just like yeah, yeah we mess up some we mess up some some you know we break we break a window you know of a of a of a pharmacy on half a block in, in baltimore and the next thing is martial law you know but the next thing is like some you know black writer you like you know as, as one you know has won some pre prestigious award or somebody got some prestigious job that never would have been been you know presented to them man so you know this is the game mm -hmm. that that's what you know this is and all, i mean all of this is 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 like a a game to manipulate and to try to siphon energy from um you know rat, rat you know black radicality black radical radical movements you know black radical culture you know and uh and you know i mean but you know and part of that as well is like you you know you're dealing with the fact that um again like why we got to be so fly you know we're everywhere it's like all 54 countries 
in uh you know that or nation states that are part of the african continent have a hip-hop scene you know mm -hmm. i didn't know this until i started i started listening uh, or started following allafrica.com you know because they're telling you you know about the hip-hop scene in uganda and malawi and uh you know tunisia and and uh namibia you know what i mean it's like um and that you know and that's africa but you know saying you know go to go to asia you know what I mean? Like it's it, there's know. a burgeoning scene in Asia that uh, even China's trying oh, to repress. I mean, oh, yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's a stab. It's a, you know, I mean, you know, China got punk rock and hip hop happening. You yeah. know what I mean? Some of the China um, stuff I've uh, seen is like uh, it seems to be like stuck in 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 mid two thousands R and B. No, no, I mean, you know, they got they got you know, some they got, that's they, like very contemporary. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, well, I just say it's like you got like a dude like where like. He's got uh, bandana, you know, yeah. cornrows, like <laughs> like straight up chrome chain. He's sitting on the edge of the bed, you know, passed yeah, out but, girl. But hey, hey, bro, you know, it's like it's fun, you know, because look, cornrows, you know, made made Al Iverson a thug. You know what I mean? So this is yeah. what I'm saying. It's like our culture like moves from radical margin to the, to definitive in the center Don't of popular practice. culture because it's because it's so fly. Like I mean, I, Iverson was was like. David Stern's nightmare, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the fact he was he was as popular as he was in the league. You know, he re he represented straight up hood gangsterism. So, I mean, and what you deal, you know, what what you deal with when our culture is also, you know, that point where, of course, as things evolve, you know, because um, I you know I like to say in pop culture, you know, a generation is every three years. So mm -hmm. every three years, mm -hmm. kids decide. Well, you know. So, you know, like, well, sagging jeans ain't cool no more. Like, we wearing tight skinny jeans and cornrows ain't ain't cool no more. So, you know, like, you know, we we gonna we gonna, we gonna express uh express ourselves with you know by bringing back the flat top or something. You know what I mean? But um, you know, I mean, and and I mean, look, we we have this we have this singular kind of reality for ourselves culturally uh nationally politically in that it's like there's no other culture in the history of the world that came out of came out of slavery and then became the definitive popular culture of the former master culture you know and we occupy so much it's it's like it's even hard to you can't reconcile the the you know the alleged 12 percent of the population with just our impact you know we seem more omnipresent than we are you know what i mean like you know it's, it's it's like you know as much as you know we might have a critique of you know what's going on in hip-hop now but then you have to step back and say damn you know um where else do young black men have a voice in america it's like nowhere you know well, well, let me let me ask you a question yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead and you know <clears throat> If I'm sounding provocative, maybe it's because I'm trying to be. But what are Please. the what are the consequences of having probably the most oppressed minority group by size in a country be mm -hmm. relegated, at least in the public consciousness, as the entertainment of the ruling class that mm -hmm. oppresses them? Well, again, like the blues existed as a as a genre, um, uh, in the same way the hip hop does, because the uh, the requirements for entry are very low relative to anywhere else. It's like the only place you can go in and uh, like be a uh, a kid from South Bronx, circa 1980, and sell a million records and get whatever put, you know, or or become, you know, like fast forward, like a a branding a branded uh, endorsed billionaire, you know, um, by doing something that is the very, you know, it's, it's like when we talk, you know, you know, definition of culture I like is the one that says, you know. Um, culture is what people do well all these things you know as we know that represent commodified black culture are stuff black people will just be doing 
you know what I mean, in the community anyway, you know, rapping, dancing, playing basketball, you know, I mean, um, so, and these things, the thing about it is like, yeah, you talk about being, a, you know, like the entertainment of the ruling class, but it never starts out. It starts out as, as like some den denigrated ni nigger shit. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's what it is. When it, when it all first comes on the scene, you know, it's like blues. Like, they call you know, that was called race music. You know what I mean? Like, the Billboard charts, like, for the longest time, you know, their R&B charts didn't reflect um, radio play, but the number of, of records that were sold out of the black mom and pop record stores, you know, in, in, in all the, the major urban areas. You know what I mean? So... You know, it's like we we began so, like disrespected, you know, and uh, denigrated and and sidelined in the American cultural context until we're not, you know, until like, you know, we we you know we we uh, we win another battle for position, you know, for presence, uh, for prestige, in the American context, you know, and we are in the American context, you know, so folks are going to make moves that are reflective of their their aspirations to get from one place to another and something like pop you know music where you know um really i mean it's still it's still it's still just more it's a more democratic opportunity than we have anywhere else in america you know Derek, nothing you want to say starts out, nothing i mean nothing starts out as the entertainment of the, the ruling class it's like they're they you know because generally like white america you know is generally like about 10 to 20 years be, behind black america you know because we're so avant-garde with our stuff you know when we launch the next iteration of it like they it's just it's it's alien you know um and you know and and uh you know i mean one one of our uh one of the benefits of our tragic history is that we, we're not burdened by nostalgia. You know what I mean? I, I like, I like, like the black comedian Flip Wilson, you know, his definition of black America is that we belong to the church of what's happening now. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> as, soon, as soon as we, as soon as, as soon as we flip, you know, the switch on what's cool, what's hip, what's modern, you know, we are there. We didn't left, you know, yesterday's blues behind. You know what I mean, but and white folks, you know, um, and the rest of the world is 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 catching up. You know what I mean? It's like, um, uh, like I, I mean, I, I like the fact that, um, you know, like in particularly in um, particularly in Paris, like like the Arab and African kids, like their like their their hip hop aesthetically is the one outside of America that I you know I just feel is like is killer you know what i mean like there's just something and it has something to do with just like maybe it's just the rhyming possibilities of 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 arabic you know in french you know what i mean but um they got you know they they got they got strong rhymers they got strong beats you know but if you know i check in on the on the beats they're using now it's like well they sound like southern hip-hop they're still saying their thing they're still and they're still being oppositional you know some some of the cats and getting put in jail for you know but okay. in terms of the yeah the musical the musical form you know it it's it still follows what's happening here you know so um and you, know, you know there's yeah. something i just want to add on real quick is that um yeah i actually i uh did an interview with a uh artist uh narcy who he's uh arabic and he canadian uh it was like dad's from uh, iraq um but like yeah like you were saying there's like something about like like arabic and <laughs> and hip hop yeah. that it does right. it does something different um to the music where it's just like it definitely is like uh, and like i don't understand the language so at this point you know it's some it, it is uh yeah but we can feel like some out of the beat it's yeah exactly yeah yes yeah, 100%. I mean, yeah i mean like yeah 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 i mean i mean that's for me that's the 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 international hip hop that just got the most funk and groove to it you know um but uh Varn, relative. did you uh, yeah. uh you, you had uh, something right. interesting yeah i was uh I, I don't feel that like um super uh confident 
like speculating about black culture for obvious reasons, but um, <laughs> uh, I I will say that one thing. Oh man, that ju I, jump in the water's fine. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every um, I will say one thing I've noticed though when I was thinking about the the kinds of diaspora art communities, and we were talking about how like right. when things got bad in the seventies, the art got more assertive and better. Uh, you know, I come out of the Jewish community, and the same was true mm -hmm. in the 30s and 40s, where we were producing pretty good art, kind of unique to ourselves. And and as we've been, as we become fully whitenized or whatever, um, uh, our art sucks. So, um, <laughs> how dare you say uh, that about oh. Seinfeld? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it, and Larry so, David. <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean in, in, in all yeah. seriousness there there does seem to be an unfortunate relationship between these arts like these cultural communities and out and out marginalization and oppression that leads to things like um I, it, it leads to interesting developments like yeah whenever there's whenever you have uh riots you're gonna see a ton of 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 uh black artists who are upper middle class get a lot of money yeah. mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but you're also um it also seems like there's like a direct a direct relationship between the quality of the art almost inverse to the political power it has but, like Bart, can i can i actually ask you a question i mean like can i just ask you like what like do you think that the I guess the acceptance of Jews within, you know, because you're saying is like when when the U.S. was more anti-Semitic, the art out of the Jewish community was better. Like, would you say, you know, their I guess <laughs> larger acceptance across the United States is, you know, I guess like the f uh, yeah, where it does turn into where you've just got Larry David and Seinfeld, and this is what the jewish jewish people provide for our entertainment um and then yeah i guess yeah do you think that and like i guess the question would be would 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 black <laughs> entertainment and art eventually come down to just blackish in the cosby show yeah i i wonder well, i mean go ahead uh no 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 because i'm 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 going to another spiel so go ahead and say your all right piece. just to answer the question i don't necessarily think it's because like we I don't think it's the cultural reasons. I think there are like material reasons why um, the art becomes less vibrant because we're more affluent. We're, I mean, you know, like Jews in America after the 1950s and 60s are one of the most affluent singular demographics in the country. Um, we're more insular and more cut off, and yet we're also more readily accepted. Um, I mean, I, I wonder, for example, um, not to sound like a, not to sound like dire, but a lot of the stuff I've seen coming out um, uh, on television productions and stuff lately that seem to embrace black culture seems a lot less vibrant than what I saw 10, 15 years ago. And I, I want to, I want to know what you guys think the relationship is between this influx of money basically and the vibrancy of the arts being produced Does the money actually do something to it negatively. So I read, and I want to get, I want to get uh, Mr. Tate's uh, uh, response to this. I had read something recently uh, where someone was talking about they called it clap and stomp music, and like, uh, so if you remember that kind of Americana folk revival of the early 2010s of mm -hmm. the Mumford mm -hmm. Sons type bands, right? All these white guys dressing like fucking turn of the century tramps, and and the the I was kind of it meshed in that because of working festivals and all those cats were headlining really large festivals. And around this same time, a little bit before that, uh, Bain Capital bought iHeartRadio. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of the guys for Mumford and Sons, I believe their parents were someone big in the church and then they felt that uh, that kind of music was really good to put ads to. Ads went with it real well because it was real simple. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that became, for a while, it still is pretty large music. Those guys right now probably could headline 
any kind of pop festival now still or at least be main stage uh talent. well you know you you i i interviewed um betty carter early in my career she just pointed out to me she said oh there's white people making millions of dollars in music that you ain't never heard of <laughs> 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 you know it's like um but i want to go you know i, I want to take a second to talk about this whole question of jewish cultural production you know post post-war because as as we know the concentration camps made Jews white in the eyes of the imperialists, you know, and they had their own role. They, 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 uh, Jews were with the creation of the state of Israel, um, were given an opportunity to play in the, in the big chess game, you know, of, uh, of the cold war, you know, and to, to, to represent the, the fact that the biggest fascists in the world, uh, the European colonial powers were then seen as um, the most humane and empathetic and supportive of people who come through Hitler's fascism, you know, because as, as somebody pointed out to me, you know, Hitler essentially got vilified for doing to Europe what Europe was doing to the rest of the world. Right. So um, but what you see in the assimilation, you know, of, of Jews into into uh, mainstream America you know, yeah, it is a diminution in terms of a uh, of um of a of a group of an ethnically um self self recognizing um uh, 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 cultural cultural production. You know, because and the last gasp of that would have really been um, the um, you know the great Jewish post war novelists. You know, that came through. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the bellows and Malamudes and mailers, you know, um, but nobody it's like after that, you don't get necessarily um, Jews identifying as Jews, you know, as artists in America, you know, as a group, you know. So, I mean, I'm and I'll stop with that particular thesis there. But mm -hmm. to, to now I want to leap into why. You still see, you still find vitality, um, great vitality in terms of Black cultural production, um, and it relates to, to me, what's the core point of Frank Wilderson's Afro pessimism, which is that, from the perspective of the ruling class, you know, um, we don't occupy a, a, a space of Black versus White, but slaves versus humans, right? And what he's essentially saying is that the social position, the perception of black people, you know, as an oppressed group is that of people who are still in the slave position, right? Still get, are still treated as slaves. And we see the evidence, you know, 1619 project, you know, just, I mean, just brought out how algorithmic it is to the point where you don't even need like a white, <laughs> um, even like um a white face you know for you know for racism is happening in the in the um in the uh the paperwork in the administration of racism where it's like you as a black harvard uh grad goes to get a, a bank loan and the bank officer's got a piece of paper that says black applying for a loan no <laughs> doesn't matter what what the bona you know the, the bona fides are bona fide bona fides are yeah you know whereas you know like the white college white high school dropout that comes in is gonna get treated you know probably as well as like the white middle class person you know um, yeah well, i mean so so state. yeah so i mean so, you know and i'll just say that like you know so the thing is like um what wilderson further points out that i think is is um is critical is that um the violence um um that we look at in terms of other groups is something that essentially is a negotiation that's between what wilderson calls humans and junior partners or you know humans you know uh, people who are who have not don't occupy the slave status that we do you know so part of that is that we maintain like the alienation 
that we feel is one of the sparks, you know, to, to um, you know, to the ignition of all this cultural innovation, you know, because we are still trying to prove our humanity, um, uh, assert our humanity, really, you know, in a context where we are not seen as human, you know, and we are dealt with as if we are not human. You know, it's like, yeah, the, the, the fact that weed is legal and everybody who ever got prosecuted for it is, is going to still do that 30 year term is a proof of that. You know, you can still treat this population like slaves and the, the violence, as Wilderson said, Wilderson says that's committed against us, you know, is it, it's not purposeful. It's gratuitous. Well, you know, um, I'm not a fan of Frank Wilson or Afro pessimism. I think he's completely trash, and I'll tell you why. At the same time, Frank, mm -hmm. Frank Wilson is making these arguments. 75% of black wealth is still owned by 10% of the black population, and much of the punishment and brutality that black people are experiencing in black cities is done under the management of black elites, black police chiefs, black cops, black mayors. And it's at the same time, all this brutality is happening. But who are the employees of? The employees of black political establishment, the black political class in those cities. And the notion man, they, was, they they work for the man too, man. They work at City Hall. Yeah, exactly. They and they're protecting they, their class. I mean, George is a perfect example of yeah, like yeah, 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 they, they, but dominated but by saying, black they, people. They, look, they're man, they're managers of some they're managers. Yeah, and, they're, and they're, they're protecting they're their class they're interests. They're well, so so do we assume that they have some kind of so so I'm man, supposed to believe yeah, I'm supposed to believe that they have some innate kind of super magical racial kinship that makes them say because I have melanin normally if it wasn't for my paycheck making sure that I'm going to most, keep this system look, going. Look, most most black most people most black people in this country who work are employees of the government. Most of them are not managers; they are employees. That, that's yeah. true. And but, yeah, but then you yeah, know, so, so, you and I mean, and and I'm I'm just saying that the people that you're looking at as being the the managers of this have masters you know they are not the they are not the i would the push back really powers. hard on that uh, let me say this before pascal gets all upset okay. i would push back really hard on that because basically you're saying that these negroes can't do anything on their own without a white person pulling their strings and i don't believe oh, that. No. And, and i say no, look, I'm, look I'm, at georgia okay, as a perfect brother, example brother, oh, brother, who, does, who does who does brock I'm obama saying, work I'm for saying, i'm saying the po i'm saying the, the policies mm -hmm. they are enacted are designed above their pay grade they are simply you know oh like, i disagree wholeheartedly I, and, and and i'll point oh, out no. maynard jackson is a perfect <laughs> example in in 70s georgia there's, there's a long list of black tom bradley in los mm -hmm. angeles and, they are, and then and, and they and they are they are like essentially like servants of the ruling class but they are not the designers of this. It's like the 60 is again, I go back to 1619 project. It's like what they, what she really, or what that section really brought out was that racism is at a, it, it operates as an algorithmic level. Yeah, you but know, it doesn't affect like, black people of all classes the same way. And oftentimes black people at higher classes. Oh, no, are well, oh, oh, uh, bro, bro, I'll give you an example of how it does. It's like the medical mistreatment. Of, pre of pregnant black women is shown to affect a Serena Williams and the and 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 the sister that's that's, that's got food stamps. They but both Greg, get you realize that the main reason the main reason why black women suffer from medical mistreatment is largely because a super larger proportion of them use Medicaid as their treatment for. And I, for but I'm telling you, it's like. The but I'm telling you, it's like be, it's be, it's be, you know it's because it's because of the the denial of a black woman's humanity when she walks into a hospital it doesn't matter where she is on the class scale right. no one she is, is no, no one's she, 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 she is she is as likely mm -hmm. to 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 um to um to to to, to suffer infant mortality as you as know what serena williams I believe, I, I believe the serena williams story comes from her having to go to an emergency room because her doctor wasn't available Serena Williams has a doctor. No, no. But here's the thing. I'm saying that th what what the analysis shows is that it doesn't matter where a black woman, not just a Serena woman, a Serena, Serena, Williams, Serena Williams is, mm -hmm. because this is this is the way systemic racism works. You know, okay. and it's well, like what, they, what like the analysis I, demonstrates actually is that poor 
and working poor black women have worse health care and material physical treatment. And because most black women are poor and working poor and depend on Medicaid, that will result in worse treatment because they have such dealing with inferior health care because most of the people who take Medicaid do not providing the best services. There's a very good book by the Ra by, by, uh, called Racecraft that talks about how racialized statistics create the illusion of comprehensive racial suffering when actually the suffering is suffered by mostly poor and working class. And that was the people. one thing that I didn't like about the New York Times piece. I mean, the New York Times piece is illuminating in the sense of there is a problem with infant mortality in the black community, but what Pascal brings up about you know, poverty doesn't really get brought up as much as the race aspect. So the entire article is almost ontological in the sense of if you are black and you and you are female, you walk into a hospital because of the Serena Williams situation. Well, then it, it's all bad for you. It's the almost same, like the Oprah and the purse situation. It's almost it's like a perfect example of mass incarceration. I'll hear this by most of my college educated fraternity brother men who go on Marcus Vineyard every summer like oh we got the same amount of chance of getting arrested and shot by a cop as a brother in the hood that's statistically false a college educated right. black man has literally right. 10 times less of a chance of interacting mm -hmm. in any in any way with a police officer than a black person with no cop with no high school diploma literally massacre mass incarceration is a race and class paradigm not just a race paradigm what what happens in, what, what what happens in these in these conversations is that because and because capitalism is race cap and this is the most important part capitalism requires black people to disproportionately be relegated to the reserve army of labor so all of the harm that comes from being re relegated to the reserve army of labor crime drugs uh, uh poor treatment poor housing, poor education is relegated to black people because capitalism requires that the super majority of society, which is white, even though there are more whites that are poor, are relegated to thinking that the system does not disadvantage them or they would rebel. So capitalism requires that black people in the American context disproportionately suffer to keep the illusion of the functionality in the minds of the white majority. So there's no question that the system, there's no debate that the system is racist, but the brunt of the racism is felt by poor and working class black people who are the super majority of black people, while educated Negroes like Oprah and Frank Wilderson, who was like a second generation tenured black professor, are whining and crying about racism while they sit sipping on their mint juleps, while the majority of black folk are not having the benefits Frank of having people Wilderson like David Brooks, David yeah. Brooks at the New York Times co sign their writing. Or Tana Easy Coach chilling, getting like you know, going to France, you know, you know, eating you know beignets or God knows what else. Because what has what happens? What happens? Hold on, let me finish. What happens is that middle class Negroes like ourselves pimp mm -hmm. out the trauma of working class and poor black people. Oh, the racism be so bad, so we can get those fat six figure checks at the Atlantic. Or those tenured jobs, because the black middle class for over a century has leveraged the suffering of poor and working class black people to allow itself to be ascended into the same grounding powder mechanisms that ground those poor and working class black people to dust. That is the reality. Well, look. well and the reality too is, is that some of the staunchest fighters for the black poor, the black working class, come from the black middle class as well. I mean, my parents. That, are that, that has two, and they are the best of a bad lot. Well, Shots man. fired. Yeah. Can, I, you, I, where's the? Where's the? You know, the, 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 you know but the, the whole thing is like is again to look at the efficacy of the effort. You know what I mean? Most of the people who showed up at the Gary convention, you know, are now you know their kids are in the black middle class yes. now. You know yes. what I mean? Like the aspirational trajectory of of black folks is is, is clearly not to be. You know, among the poor and the working, I mean, in and the impoverished, you know, the poor, the impoverished working class, you know, what I mean, but that's why, you know, like most of um, um, the um, the uh, the freshmen at the HBCUs now are black women and that the fastest 
growing population in terms of like uh, self um, self owned business businesses are among are among black women who come from the working class. You know. Well, I mean, Greg, listen, brother, listen, we're good. Hold Greg, on, hold on, good. Pascal, hold on. Look, man, we didn't bring Greg on to have a talk about fucking Afro pessimism, and I blame this all on Derek <laughs> Barnes. You know, I mean, no, I mean, I, I'm, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad, you know, like, I'm glad for the pushback. You know what I mean? <laughs> It's like listen, I, brought, I, I, brought, I brought I brought I brought Frank into it, you know what I mean? Look, look, I just so, want to I mean, but, I, but all these things are all these things are connected, you know what I mean? I, I, like, I, let me just say this first as as a Good fan. Point. Like yes. literally, Mr. Tate. Yes. I need you to understand that it is because of you and people like you that made me feel good about playing guitar as 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 a black kid playing punk and metal music in in my hood of, of Richmond, California. So I, yes, I first and foremost have to have to get that out. Um and Frank yeah. Wilderson unfortunately is too uh Frank, Frank is roadkill up in here. I he he so well, you know, I have a lot of friends that are uh a very good friend of mine is a, a, a fellow professor at Irvine with him and actually yeah. uh, got her her doctor around the same time. So unfortunately i you you this is tame compared to the conversations that pascal and i have off air right, <laughs> and me right. and my friend that actually works with with wilderson she and and is a, a acolyte of of wilderson have have off air so uh this yeah. was not well, you know i mean and, I had and, and, uh, yeah and i mean the thing is in, in academia now it's like the it's like radical black feminists have like they've definitely taken picked the bones of 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 uh of what they feel they need out of ap and and for them it's not he's not even in the conversation you know but there are aspects of yeah. his his critique that are part of 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 the critique they're mounting within the academy you know but again like somebody said yeah, you need to have a whole show on, on, uh, <laughs> on, on, on AP. <laughs> and we have so, to yeah, blame let's, let's get back let's get back to earth with the uh, fires y'all yeah <laughs> Yacht, yacht rock, yacht rock and shit. You know. yeah, we're, we're gonna put Ferdine and Philip Belly up, you know, on the double bill with Jimmy Buffett. Jimmy Buffett now. That's their last <laughs> Oh shit. Okay. okay. Yeah. Go for it, Marcus. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. We we, we so, gonna we gonna we gonna forget about Serpentine Fire. And, let's go um, that, you know? yeah. and that's the way that's the way of the world. Talking about uh uh mysticism and uh, world philosophy and uh so forth and so on and all help yeah. get to to a higher place as we get into the revolutionary I, nature of margaritaville brother, <laughs> I hope, I, 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 brother i hope hey. i didn't put a bad taste in your mouth brother i just you know i you know you know, you know we've interacted on social media before you know, I, don't apologize. Don't apologize. No, man. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, mean, I mean, look, man, it's, it's like, look, we, we, we are not in control of the way our culture just gets manipulated and twisted and discarded and, you know, assimilated, you know what I mean, over time. But I think we always have to remember that it starts out in the gut of America. It starts out among us. It starts out when we're the only ones. They, they give a damn about a band called Funkadelic, you know. <laughs> well, and I, I so the question that that I have is, I guess you know what you know. This is to the panel. What do y'all think is like the potential for music to aid in you know a movement, you know, or even like some type of like revolutionary behavior, right? You know, and like we talk about how hip hop is like taken as like the extent of of. <laughs> of of black revolution in in the 90s uh like but but what 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 can music do for you know well, people trying i mean to take we got we have to look well i mean you know i'm sure by now everybody's seen summer of soul you know what i mean That's and like that in that context i mean all that music was a soundtrack to a revolution you know i mean in fact that you know as we know that concert that series even happened because you know the powers of being in new york were afraid of another april 4th 1968 happening you know like because the because of you know the the um um the resistance and and uh, the furor against oppression that existed in the city you know at that time and you you know was was um uh, with the you know like uh, black panthers and the young lords 
you know, mm-hmm. being kind of at their peak in terms of communicating, you mm-hmm. know, folks. But um, I mean, I don't know that any any Panther, you know, like would have gotten up at that point in time and said anything, you know, would have read like David Nelson's poem the way Nina Simone did. But Nina, Nina like kind of made her declaration, you know, with Mississippi Goddamn, you Oof. know, back back in, you know, 63, 64, 65. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, she made a trip. She gave she gave up a whole career, you know, to be who we know her as, you know what I mean? And, um, you know, you have a Curtis Mayfield, like, I mean, yeah, man, folks, folks on the line, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the movement said like, yeah, that, that movement got us, that, that music got us through all those jailings and beats, you know, keep on pushing, moving up. We're a winner. You know what I mean? So we, we, it's like, we got a history, um, of the inspirational, power of of our of our music you know when the funk is uncut you know what i mean like to to actually galvanize and um uh spiritually inspire you know politically inspire folks to 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 um to action you know um but you know it's 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 again man i mean we're, we're you know like i just like to be a certain realist about the cultural um reality of america you know um when it comes to the the ability to put temptation and distraction and and betrayal you know um and confusion you know in in our our um expressions of ourselves you know within the the uh the cultural commodity system i'll say that i want to ask so i want to go back to uh, your right Yeah. yeah I want to go to your writing in your good old days. I'm, I'm originally born and raised in New York City, where you now live, Jamaica, Queens, to be exact. Mm-hmm. And I remember mm-hmm. you from your days writing at uh, the Village Voice. And I'm going to yeah. bring well, up, a, yeah. I want to bring up a uh, figure, controversial to some, many people mm-hmm. did not like. Who uh, I know you, you uh, fondly eulogized in for several days on social media. Who I found to be an interesting person. I understood his shortcomings and oh. his limitations, but we're going to talk about yeah. it because I really, I'm glad you're on the show, Stanley Crouch. Yeah, yeah, I, I knew where you were going, man. No. I mean, I, I thought it was like, Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Stanley Crouch did some shitting on hip hop. <laughs> now, now, oh, yeah, yeah, I, but well, here's, I mean, here's, here's, the, here's, the, here's the thing with Uncle Stanley. You know, as Vernon Vernon Reed and I called him, you know, because. You got one version of of, of Stanley um, in the in the in the press in the media, and then but if you talk to Stanley, you heard some other things. You know what I mean? Like um, he's the epitome of the complicated black man that nobody understood. Maybe not even his woman. You know, <laughs> Stanley Stanley enjoyed the position of being the provocateur and the contrarian, and um, and the cat that just like made people's head hurt you know what i mean but he you know and he was also he was also a career a careerist and an opportunist you know there were certain positions he took where he knew like this was going to advance his position in terms of um new york literary establishment certainly you know and he was you know he's beloved by those folks you know but um um and you know we used to you know we used to go at it you know, over over different positions. And I saw his positions change, you know, around certain things, you know, because of the, uh, you know, the art. It's like, I remember when I first met him, you know, he was talking about rosters and Bob Marley as, uh, quote, those guys with hair that looks like dirty pipe cleaners. Right? Oh, well, now, now, by the time, now by the time Bob became lionized, that's me. Stanley was talking to me. Stanley was talking to me about how amazing a poet he was, you know, um, or, you know, like Stanley's known for, you know, for writing, writing these, these jihads against uh, Miles Davis, you know what I mean? Um, and his electric music. <clears throat> but then he, he pulled me aside and started talking about how ferocious that music was and, you know, how power, <clears throat> excuse me, like, um, like uh what what an amazing guitar player you know pete cozy was and you know like the 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 noise he generated so i mean you know it was like 
which Stanley Crouch were you gonna get from one from one day to the next? You know, were you were you gonna get like the aesthetician, you know, like the black musical aesthetician? Because I mean, there's no question. Like, if you you know, um, if you go to where where the brother was strongest, which is like his musical analysis. Oh, I mean, you know, he's he he's he's kind of beyond peer, you know, in terms of his ears like what he heard in music, you know, but I, you know, I also feel like, you know, I started reading the village voice because of Stanley, because of what he was writing about, you know, his community, you know, um, 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 in the cats that came to New York with him in the seventies, man, you know, David Murray's and Oliver Lakes, and Butch Morris, and Julius Hemphills, all these cats, Cecil, T you know, all these avant-garde, you know, the whole avant-garde scene. I, I started reading the voice because I wanted to keep up with what my favorite cats we're doing and um and then then the but when Winton came along the opportunist in him like leaped out like a big dog i mean he basically started trashing all his old friends to jump aboard you know that train and and they rode it all the way to uh you know their own building in, in lincoln center you know so um yeah I, and i mean you know look man you just like i mean with any any folks that like come to occupy a certain status and position in 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 the new york cultural sphere like there's a whole there's a whole lot of there's a complicated story there's a very complicated story to tell and stanley's is one i just know well because i watched it all happen you know but um but yeah and, and even in turn you know it was like you know when when um you know i was given that space to uh on facebook it was a lot of it a lot of what i did was just reprinting the very positions that people were taking, you know, so, you know, um, you know, to, you know, there was some folks, I, some folks I reposted just, just like for them, he was just, just a sellout Negro, um, to other folks that talked about, you know, like what a difference he made in terms of their careers as writers, the time he spent with them, you know, like one, one, one of my dudes was talking about like shit. He, when Stanley was in the hospice, you know, he went to see him every day, you know, and they they watched some of their favorite movies or talked about, you know what I mean? Like, so you got a cat that just, you know, part of his complication is generating equal degrees of love and hate, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, all you got left with anybody is um, what's in the work, you know what I mean? Like, so when I, when I read, like Stanley wrote a piece <clears throat> that people wouldn't even, couldn't even believe, like the Stanley, it's like, the Stanley Krauss of 19, of 1980 uh, wrote a piece that the people who knew the Stanley Crouch of like 1998 wouldn't even believe. It was a whole piece like celebrating funk and funk inside of like avant-garde black music. You know what I mean? It's called uh, take rising, taking Atlanta to the, Atlanta to the, rising Atlanta to the top. And you and know, I want to yeah, yeah, go ahead ask you about that to, to pivot away from Stanley Crouch. Sorry, Pascal. Yeah. Last night. I watched the Rick James documentary on Showtime. Uh, thank you. I mean, I say thank you because, you know, I, I got a few things to say about that. Yeah. Um, I, I am a fan of Rick James music. That's why Rick James is mm -hmm. the thumbnail. That's why Rick James is a picture behind us. It's a screenshot from the Good. Super Freak video. Um, uh, brother, what, you see, I, 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 don't, I don't have the... Uh... The laptop position with glow is right here. <laughs> I, I <laughs> saw that. I saw that behind you. Out on <laughs> right? Yeah. So so Rick James yeah. to me is an interesting figure because I feel like he yeah. takes what Parliament Funkadelic did or was mm -hmm. doing at the time right. and mixes it with pop music in a way that I think the only person that surpassed that maybe was Prince. Prince had a more of a poppy feel to what he was doing, but it still was funky. Rick James kept yeah, it funky, but, kept it yeah. street, but also definitely had the the hooks and grooves that helped him sell millions uh, of records. Right. Yeah. Well, One I mean, of, you know, oh, the thing, oh, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So um, there's a there's a pivotal yeah, go moment. Ahead, let me tell, tell, tell me what you thought of the film. Oh, the document! I, I, you know what? Uh, first of all, I, I never get to see Tanya Hajazi speak too much, and she's kind of a a, a big character in his life. Sorry. 
uh, post uh, post his fame years. So getting to see her speak, you never really get to see his kids speak. So hearing, hearing his kids yeah. speak. Um, <laughs> uh, hearing his band, I, I love uh, Levi Ruffin, actually. Levi Ruffin is hilarious to me, uh, hilariously yeah. honest. Um, I felt like yeah. a lot of the people they had in the in the documentary and, and also taking old interviews from him, it was really, really interesting. And I've, I've also known people because because my short time in the music business that have uh, crossed paths with with Rick James and had their own uh, Rick James stories to tell at various points of his of his life, right? Yeah, um, he's a bigger than life character that becomes a caricature, and then somehow towards the end um, makes that kind of work for him. Um, he's a complicated figure mm -hmm. uh, because of how his life does end i thought i thought i did a pretty good job of telling that story also but you know also keeping it uh, soundly in the music not all about the drama because the musical story of rick james is very very important you know going to canada and finding yourself oh yeah burgeoning yeah. music scene up there and being a player in it to the point where you then go take this new sound to motown with the minor birds that doesn't work out you serve some time <laughs> for being a draft yeah. dodger then come back and, right. and writes for motown and i'm glad that they actually brought that up too he was a, he was a staff writer and, yeah and session guy yeah um, yeah yeah no i mean there's a lot of revelations i mean i, I like the story about uh how he got his cornrows i mean the african sister on a plane yeah <laughs> and, and having and having her break it down and like and it, you know her doing his hair the next thing you know it's like yeah i mean he he, he, he it's like he he comes up with his own version of being a long-haired rapper, I mean rocker, you know. Um, I mean, I would say on balance, I have a problem with the second half of the film. I feel it's like too much cocaine and not enough reverent reference back to the musical glory, you know. And um, I, I felt like it got just a little too caught in the a kind of a a tabloid TMZ downward spiral in the in the second half, you know. Um, could see why, you know, like as a documentarian you feel like you got to tell all of that story but i feel there was a way to come back in the end to you know why rick james matters you know so um you know so it's a struck it's a structural problem for me you know structural storytelling problem uh, you, but, you, i mean you knew it was but, gonna get, but, get, but getting there but getting there yeah was 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 like i mean a hell of a ride i mean i love carrie gordy in there man yeah, you know, it was just like, yeah, that that I mean, the story about him jumping on the table and revving his thing, and the cat after that assault, the guy says, "We're about to make Lionel Richie happen." So <laughs> pass now, and Marcus yeah. and Eric, I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil this for you, and hopefully you guys go watch this yeah. documentary. It's on Showtime. So Carrie yeah. Gordy, Barry is Barry Gordy's son. I'm uh, the one who told right. you about the documentary. No, you didn't. Motherfucker, Showtime told me about the documentary. You ain't TV guy. <laughs> So, <laughs> <laughs> so oh, uh, y'all brother, y'all brothers is live, man. I love it. <laughs> man, I love it. I love it. I love it. Show. Hey, I hey. Talk about, oh, I talk about it. I, it's like that, look. I, it's like I ain't got. I ain't got. I ain't got too many of my nerves that can go from Frank Wilderson to, to Rick James. Y'all, y'all, y'all are a rarefied quantity of it is. Like a damn. So. Hey, hey, Marcus, Marcus, check this out. Check this out. You two D. So apparently, Kerry Gordy, Barry Gordy's son, was managing Rick James, and he said Rick James would deliver a record. This is how you know this was back in the day. This shit doesn't right. happen anymore, okay? Right. Rick James would deliver a record, right? You deliver your 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 tape, and the record label will give him a million dollars. And yeah. <laughs> so Rick James goes to like, deliver his record. Unhe and he's unheard. Un unheard. You know, you're not doing this shit no more. <laughs> Trust me, as a person has delivered some records, <laughs> right? So, so Rick James delivers a record, right? The the record before is the Street Songs, which was got all the hits that you know, not all the hits, but a lot of the hits that you know did great. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was, I mean, what shit, man? Was some kind of some kind of multi platinum record. The next you know, record doesn't do as well, right? On the live tour, doesn't do as well. 
So James is mad. Which, I, which, I, which I'll interject as, as a Go friend ahead. of mine. Uh, no, no, I'll just say a friend of mine's uh, dad is a basketball coach, and his his famous saying is, they don't pay niggas to sit on the bench. <laughs> right? Mm. So it's like, yeah, it's like, if you ain't delivering, like, six million the next time, like, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're useless. You know, you, you're, you're fodder. And, and there's a, there's a laundry list of bands, right? We can name that had a great record and the second one doesn't do as well. And then all of a sudden nobody wants to fuck with you. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. They, oh yeah. Toast. Yeah. They're done. You know, cause they don't pay niggas. Yeah, James, the James goes into the studio, the head of Motown, right? There's a white guy. This year that Barry Gordy's been gone. Yeah. And, uh, he, they said Rick James is so mad that he jumps on the tape, throws everything off the president's table, <laughs> takes out an eight ball of Coke, chops lines of Coke on the, on the CEO's table, does a line, and Kerry Gordy said Rick James takes his dick and puts it into his face <laughs> and starts hollering at him about he sold... Well, it's about MTV. It's about MTV. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and know, so, I mean, it, it, but it, ultimately they give the 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 budget, the promotion budget to Lionel Richie, and that's when right. Off the Wall comes up. Yeah, not well, Off that, the Wall. You know, that's, 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 that's well, Sorry. Well, you know, and and I mean, we had to say that like Rick James, I mean, he took it to the wall, you know, took it to the mat, uh, um, in terms of MTV, not playing black artists, not playing him. I mean, to the point that like the label was pissed at him you know for rising up you know so i also i you know when you get to that segment of the thing and you look at um how prince happened because because yeah. of rick james michael happened yeah. you know shit, run 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 dmc you know lionel richie it's like man he's the kurt flood of music <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah i mean you know he he's the brother that sacrificed himself so does you know like, like, uh, you know, like, uh, Le- so, so LeBron could create the big three in Miami, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, is it worth I mean? it because he gets, he gets, you can't touch this. Like, does MC Hammer want to sample Rick James 10 years later for you can't touch this if Rick James is what we see Prince? become because of mtv and i don't know if rick james ever would have been what prince or michael jackson well i, were. Well, I mean it, you know i mean it just comes down to uh the opportunities that are again in the change and same of of, of of black music you know what i mean like he had all i mean you know like he had already made you know he'd already made his you know super freak money you know what i mean <laughs> so by the time you get to to hammer it's just somebody looking for like a great a great uh break beat you know mm-hmm. what i mean it's like it has no i mean it has really nothing to, like it has nothing to do with rick james like rick james is the beneficiary because his name is on the publisher you know what i mean but the idea of rick james is is disappeared you know and the, the annals of of uh of pop culture by that time you know like yeah, it's just it's just a great hook you know that that uh that everybody knows, you know, when when great hooks were what was selling hip hop records, great R and B hooks of the seventies, what was selling hip hop records. Yeah, and that's not know, even uh, a hook. I mean, I think he took like the first twenty four bars or some shit. <laughs> well, that that's that's a hook. Shit, shit. Like there's some hip shit, man. There's some hip hop hooks that are um ain't but two bars, man. You know, like uh, yeah, you, you know, know the Dos Effect. No, no, you know the Dos Effect song. Um, microphone check, microphone check. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Man, that 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 came from that comes from James Brown's think, and it's like it's barely oh. like a bridge, you know what I mean? Like they, I mean, I it's like I was listening to the other day. I was like, damn, they took two bars and, and made like a classic out of it. So, but the, I mean, that's hip hop, you know, and that's hip hop, man. It's just that ability to like uh, miniaturize like classic soul gold, you know, and st- and create a new hit on top of an old one. That's you know. what to me was 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 artful about the sampling culture, either taking very rare records oh, yeah. or taking these little bitty, like you said, two bars. De La right. Soul did it really well. Uh, the Paul's Boutique album. Oh, man, yeah. Boys, you, yeah. You know, kind of where you well, hit. you know, I, I, you know, like, I mean, De La, man, you know, they get props for like 
every 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 well-known record they sample mm -hmm. when you hear the original you think of their version <laughs> <laughs> like in your mind you know what i mean it's like you know break it down or, break it down gonna say know, especially uh, break it down say, say no it. say no go um you know me myself and i like if i hear freak of the week i think of them if i hear the hall and oats i think of them you know it it works that i mean that's how you know that's how you know how musical those cats were it, it kind of works you know works both ways yeah but um, by the time you get to puffy you know i think he takes i we, well, we i mean to, but, 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 it's, it's yeah, 40 bars yeah. i think he takes yeah. for that uh that uh let's dance well i mean well that and and you to me like that's the real end of the golden age when somebody who can't rap actually can have a hit record because before then you definitely had to have talent you know what I mean? And he kind of he he kind of <laughs> transitioned us into this into this place where it's like you didn't have to be a real rapper. Take that, you know, take you know, that, take that. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? But uh um damn some but you know, but, but you know, that's also why like you gotta give it up to Rizza, because like he comes in the air where you can't afford samples, and he's just like, Okay, I'm gonna yeah. sample these chi these these kung fu movies. For hooks. Public domain, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, it's like, yeah. Let me let me let me just to totally vi violate territorial copyrights. You know? And I, yes. I want to ask you before we go because I got you here. Yes. So there's a there's a group that uh, big influence on me. Two groups big influence on me. One is Bad Brains. And I think Derek will speak to this. Uh, yeah. we're both punk guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, bad yeah. Brains is a, is a huge influence on me. Early Bad Brains, mm -hmm. um, and Fishbone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like the thing. Um, I appreciate them and, and about about them and 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 um, uh, my boys who live in color is mm -hmm. like. They created original black rock music that required people inspired by them to actually learn how to play their instruments really well, you know, because they all made no, because it's all it's like you know, like punk rock before the bad brain just celebrated amateurism, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And these cats came out of they came out of the funk, they came yep. out of you know, go go, and they came out of fusion, like. You know, uh, like I think Daryl Daryl Jennifer told me, yeah, yeah. One day, Doctor No showed up to their rehearsal, and um, he could play every lick of a Return of Forever's "Romantic Warrior." You know what I mean? So you talking about cast that <laughs> took that that level of musical prowess to creating their own genre. You know, mm -hmm. Fishbone did it in in their own way. You know, creating original music um, that is hella impressive on on multiple levels. You know what I mean? Like on a sonic level, lyrical level, lyrical level, political level, you know, um, trans, trans genre splicing level, you know, and um, and really left a, a, a legacy of, of, of music for the for the folks to follow behind them um, to really ev evolve as as musicians within, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I mean, they're they're um um but the brains in particular man i mean i mean they just you know you it's like every once in a while like a group comes along um and they just create music that would not have existed without them you know yeah um and they do it and they do it massively like er, like early earth wind and fire <laughs> not, not yacht rock not uh, yacht rock <laughs> i'm just saying I'm just saying. Right, you go to right. the first five, the first five albums, they kill it. It was like, you know, when when I when I hear when I hear Living Color, let's speak about Living Color. Yeah, right. we, we were having a conversation in the on tour once about riffs, and mm -hmm. that riff for a cult of personality. Oh yeah, be, when you talk about some of the best hard rock rock riffs of all yep. time, you have. Yep. To that riff in there. Oh, and 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 I don't know if you know the the story about that is that <laughs> that was something they just came up with jamming in a rehearsal, man. You know, and it's and it and it just points to like what bands can generate that machines cannot. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's the product of those those four dudes 
you know, like having their own dedicated space in East New York when you could get shot in New York and not uh, in East New York and and not shoot um, the HBO series Girls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it was like, yeah, those brothers were over there eight hours a day. And, and boom, one day, they were, you know, they were just jamming and that's what came out. You know, you and, know. I get, and, then, I, um, and then Verna told me, like, when they did the recording, it was like, when he went to take his solo, he didn't want. He was tired. He was dead tired, man. Mm-hmm. He didn't. Even, he didn't even want to do it. And then the solo we got is the classic. You know what I mean? But again, it's like again, what you know, what um, you know why 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 bands can still you know could still matter. You know, I mean, I was. It's it's kind of like it's not even that. It's like I think that um, like we're not gonna get to that next evolution in terms of our music, um until we return to some semblance of, of band culture. Cause like, you know, like pretty much with, you know, with digital culture, um, you know, we've established, you know, what you can do and people are doing like variations on that. And, you know, I mean, I listen to something like, like uh, the dance music that's coming out of uh, South Africa now, Mar piano. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, that that's, that's some of the, that's like the best chill music I've heard in years. You know what I mean? But it's not necessarily extending by leaps and grounds the vocabulary of the music. You know. Um, so and, and can I ask this yeah, too? Is like, that's, you know, that's my two cents on that. Um, I mean, obviously, like we're going through like a pandemic, and you know, we talk about touring and like, especially like Jason, you you talk about this a lot. Hello. Um, Whatever I go. A little bit of like mm-hmm. making, right? Like of like I said, making. Yo, where did everybody go? <laughs> We're here. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. I, that was my point. Yeah. That was my point. Um. But yeah, as far as like ma- even like making well, music, no. and well, even like no. as far as like living color bands. I don't think he hears. Oh. Word. Oh, I hear. I hear you guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We see you. Yeah. We see you. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I was. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, yeah, I mean, yeah, I said my piece on all of that, man. You know what? what, what, what oh no, somebody's that? asking you another question. Yeah, well, I, I got okay. a question. Oh, okay. yeah. that I'm not hearing. What is? What's the question? Hello, hello. Can everybody is hear that me? Pascal, I see you said I have no. A that's question, Mar- it's Marcus. Marcus is asking oh, okay. you a question. Okay, I, okay. Uh, it's I'm it's not it's, hearing you, Marcus. it's one of the yeah. It's just one of these silly people with the bl- with the bl- with the dirty pipe cleaner hair. <laughs> yeah, I can't. No, uh, I can't. What you know? I can't. You can't hear Marcus. Marcus. Well, re- repeat the question for me. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, just re- 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 revert it around. And actually, if Jason, you kind of want to even talk about this, is like, um, COVID. Obviously, it is like separated um, a lot of what's going on. Yeah, I, I'm not hearing anybody. <laughs> well, except, except, except for your, except for, I, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yo, I'm hearing your laughing ass. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then I, I think I hear Pascal. Test, test one, two, I haven't said anything. I don't know, man. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You go ahead. Yeah. Marcus, try yeah, again. Yeah. Okay. All Marcus right. Marcus is trying I, to yeah, answer, ask a question, but he doesn't seem to be getting picked up by you. The deep state yeah, got yeah, Marcus. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't know if he's muted or what, but I, I'm not I'm not hearing him. Well, yeah, y'all can hear me except for Greg. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Ask, All right, right. Well, you don't punish me. Can you hear him now? <laughs> is I you know like uh, speak, Marcus. Speak. Is there is there a limit? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. Is I'm there not a here. limit? <laughs> nah, we can't. Hear. But, Marcus, you don't punish me. Marcus, right this. <laughs> what what is Marcus. what is his this, what is his question? <laughs> He's trying to ask. Marcus, write it in the I'm chat. Saying, write it in the chat, Marcus. No, write the question in the chat. Hey, can, okay. Can you summarize it? You know what I mean. Is 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 there a limit to what can be done during this pandemic? You know, is is music not going to be even full? And like even hip hop music, uh, which is largely a digital thing, you know, until people can actually get in a room can, together yeah. and make music. Marcus wants to know. Uh, I'm I'm going to fuck this question up. He's talking about music during the pandemic and touring. Uh huh. And. Uh, well, people are touring right now. Uh, I do know people that have actually caught COVID already on the road that were vaccinated, uh, bands and crews. Um, 
what do you see as the future of live music in the post COVID era? Uh, well, uh, it's funny. I, um, I was asked that question, um, in a, by, you know, by a journalist, by email. And I just said, I told him, I was like, Oh, there's not going to be any, there's no such thing as a post COVID era any more than there's going to be a post climate change era. Like COVID, <laughs> is here to stay. COVID is here to stay. COVID, 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 COVID got mutant cousins. <laughs> like, they got some new, they got some new variant in South Africa. They talking about, you know what I mean? So You're talking about the, like, the just group? like we, just like we live, is it's like you're dealing with the seasonal flu on steroids, man. You know what I mean? It's like COVID, COVID ain't going nowhere. I mean, it's 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 a determinant. It's going to be a determinant of everything that happens culturally and economically from here on out. You know, like they were they were saying, like I, somebody just told me that um the reason that you didn't see as much seasonal flu is because COVID just came in there and took over. It just it just basically like wiped seasonal flu out and it, and plant you know planted itself in in that place in our in our respiratory systems, you know. Um, but so it you know what what you what you're going to see is how people are adapting to the new reality so when we played um uh lincoln center um uh burn sugar played lincoln center a couple of weeks ago um you know you got seats by going online and applying to a lottery you know and so and the audience you know it was um you know they had what they call the pod system like two two chairs yeah kind of pat you know um um put together you know um and you know that that's how folks were sitting and it was probably a third of the audit of the usual capacity you know um like we've got situations where we're being offered um outdoor gigs and the protocol like will change before you get to the gig like um like we just did uh brooklyn museum and at first they weren't requiring proof of vaccination. It was just, you you know, they're going to have everybody sign, sign a waiver that basically absolved the museum of responsibility if your ass got sick. But the week of the gig, they were just like, yeah, nobody's coming in here who can't yeah. show proof of vaccination. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's like when you try to be predictive about the future of live music, you know, you just know that like, I mean, at best, it's going to be like what we saw with the, um, you know, with the NBA, you know, um, like in this past season where it was like, yeah, it was start out. It was only 5,000 people, you know, in the arena. And then, um, you know, we, we thought like, okay, we had turned that curve. So by the end of the, the thing, I think they had what 20,000 people in a, in a, what is it? 50,000 seat arena. Well, well you know you what know, I think? Uh, this is what go I ahead, think. Go ahead. And this is go just ahead. my working in festivals uh, and doing the finance side of it, the number side of it. This yeah. is what I think. Yeah. I think that Fire Festival was not an aberration as far uh, as uh-huh. a, a bunch of really, really rich people going to an island to go hear music live and feel very comfortable right. about who they're being around. And the pod system for a lot of places uh is extremely expensive because you have to yeah. buy multiple tickets so even if just you and a homie want to go sometimes not all the time sometimes you have to buy three yeah. or four tickets i may not have three or four ticket money so who is good first of yeah. all who's going to be the band or 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 act that's going to command that someone pay more money because you also have to pay more money for food and beverage because that's a whole different entity that deals with well yeah i mean well i i mean i think what we're going to move towards you know and and here's where uh you know we can really get into some interesting conversations like i, I read somewhere somebody was saying that um um you know china's becoming a more capitalist country and america is actually becoming a more socialist country you know <laughs> because because uh, they said because they said like yeah they said basically if you're in china like like you have the most secure private property rights in the world. Whereas in America, like, oh, there definitely would have been a revolution without them damn stimulus checks. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so, and I just say that to say that um, 
all anytime you you go to see music in Europe, it is uh, tax payer subsidized, you know, because culture is subsidized there. So, like, you know, uh, a band that, that that might be able to get capacity at the Blue Note for one night can go over to Europe and play a, a festival with fifty thousand people in it, playing some some yep. <laughs> some dissonant avant garde stuff. Yep. You know what I mean? Because um, they those culture in the, in those social democracies have decided that you know culture matters as much as food. So you know we're gonna make it available to our folks, and we're gonna and we're gonna be able to bring over the best performers <laughs> from Black America to play it because we don't have people that can do it on the level that they can. You know, so I mean, if I if I had any kind of so I, yeah, basically saying yeah, you know, like. The sub the, the subsidizing of live music on that arena level, that stadium level, you know, I mean, it's going it's it's going to have to come through through our tax dollars, you know, if it's going to happen at all, because people are not people are not going back to these stadiums in those numbers. No, you know, uh, no. To support and, and small, yeah, it's, it's small yeah. venues got bought yeah. out at, at the end, and yeah. also too with a lot of the the CARES Act money. Uh, that was supposed to go to helping small venues really didn't. A lot of real estate companies oh, got yeah. it. So I, I think uh, what we're seeing is the death yeah. of the small venue. As you know, as a New Yorker, you know this better yeah. than anybody. I oh, can't yeah, think of anywhere you know, I played in New York that's still open. <laughs> and I was yeah. just in New right. York in like right. 2019. Right, right. Yeah, that's, I mean, that, you know, I mean, we, you know, we, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, um, no, I mean, like, in fact, um, I told you where our first two gigs mm -hmm. were at subsidized arts venues like Lincoln Center, um, you know, Brooklyn Museum, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and then we've got like there's a, a festival coming up on my block, uh, the Sugar Hill Jazz, Jazz Festival, and that's happening because um, the sister organizing it had a had a, a a wealthy friend that said, "I'll just bankroll your whole thing, you know. Mm -hmm. You don't even worry about it, you know." But then our next gig after that is up at a place called Real Artways in Hartford, you know. Again, subsidized cultural institution, you know what I mean. So, um, um, you know, those are the places. But those those are the those those places are equivalent to what you find in um in europe you know for uh for jazz you know like um like i mean one one thing one of the things i i, I found out from you know burn sugar going going to paris so many times it's like man the blackest hood in paris like has a state-of-the-art like a, a lincoln city or a brooklyn academy music level venue in there you know it's like i mean you can literally get off a train in some place that literally like looks like brooklyn mall in terms of the demographic mm -hmm. but you cross the street and it's like you know you got an alice tully hall to play in you know what i mean so that's uh you know i mean it's 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 just you know it's just where the society has decided like like matters for the population <laughs> like like free health care and free and free college you know but um i don't see how economically um like the the um you know the 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 the, the cultural venues the the college venues you know are going are going to survive you know for, you know 10 years more without you know them becoming socialized yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think there's limitations to music being made uh during covid due to the reliance on the digital mediums Oh yeah, man. I mean, it's back to the thing I was saying about, you know, the cult of personality riff come, comes out of five cats sweating over, sweating in, you know, in in, in like a, a a do or die uh, uh, rehearsal studio in, in in East 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 New York. You know what I mean? It's like that. I mean that that um um that latency factor. Yeah, that's it. Like that's that's not working, man. You know, like that that streaming band stuff is like everybody knows like. You you can't you can't stay on the one when when everybody is behind the beat, you know what I mean? Because of because of digital transmission. So, yeah, I mean like, yeah, to the extent that folks can't 
can't just get together and play and make the magic happen in front of an audience, man. Yeah. You know, um, like, um, uh, cause everybody, everybody's just not, you know, like, you know, I mean, trap, trap, making the perfect trap beat. It's not everybody's aesthetic goal. You know what I mean? Like they got that down, you know what I mean? But if you're trying to do something else, you know, you, you, you definitely need like, um, um, you know, you need the old world, old, old world, old world conditions. You know, oh, I, I, I miss being in a room. I haven't been in a room with my bandmates since we loaded uh, out our last yeah. show, January 2020. No, nah, man, we yeah. went up. Yeah, we we uh we did a we did a for the Lincoln Center show about three weeks ago. Yeah, we did our first rehearsal together in a year and a half, man. You know, and um, and we were in a, in a well ventilated room <laughs> and, uh, you know, and because it was kind of pre delta paranoia you know like folks eventually took off their mask some you know a couple folks didn't you know he did the whole rehearsal in there and you know like one of our cast you know he he did the brooklyn museum gag in his, in his mask man you know so you got uh, the, uh but this is all adaptation you know this, i mean you know like we talk about a you know like a post covid world it's like no it's it's kind of like um uh, it's an adaptation to covid world in which <laughs> You know, we're gonna take risks. You know, I mean, that's the whole thing. It was a trumpet player. Uh, what's that? that? Wearing, it was a trumpet player wearing the mask the whole time. I think. Right. I'll say again. Uh, lost. <laughs> it was Marcus. <laughs> Don't worry about it, man. It was Marcus again. Nobody. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. go? <laughs> Derek had a question. Derek uh, had a question. Yeah, I, I, he, I, he's, I, he's on punishment. I guess. It was uh, kind of an okay. observation and a question, but it, it's I I have yeah. been thinking about the risky musicians because of our friends here. Um, one of the people that we lost was a jazz musician and they continued performing for yeah. a while, like way later than I would have expected yeah. them to during right. the first round of COVID. But now all those clubs have gone up, have just gone away. Like they're all gone. And it, yeah. it, it so yeah. there's, there's kind of two things that I, I see that echoes that, right? Like all the jazz clubs, most of the punk clubs, they're all gone. They've been actually kind of exploding here in, in Salt Lake because we're way cheaper than New York and California right but that's yeah. changing yeah. rapidly so <laughs> yeah um but we no, like, i mean you know it's mm -hmm. like, go ahead no, go no ahead. i go just ahead. Go ahead. i just think i i think we underestimate the danger to musicians though because that's that's who we've lost yep. you know musicians and like well, I mean, I, nurses I, I and can, teachers I, well I, <laughs> yeah i mean I, I mean i can tell you it's like i i got a, a 15 to 17 piece band depending on the gig it's like mm -hmm. nobody is more concerned about the survival of musicians than musicians <laughs> themselves you know mm -hmm. and um and to the extent that we're able to offer work again it's because there's subsidized institutions that are opening that are opening back up where um um you know like you know folks can can gig and still be paid because you know, musicians are part as much as part of the the gig economy, as like you know, food delivery folks and and uh, you know, Lyft and Uber drivers. You know, like the work, the average working musician. You know, we talk we talking about like you know the difference between uh, the class difference. You know, between the majority of folks and you know the, the folks at another other end of the scale. It's like, I mean, the music business is the is kind of the epitome of that like mm -hmm. i mean you know that i mean you know this castle that i mean it did deal with a sliding pay scale they were in the best of best of times they were dealing with a sliding pay scale so you might go to europe and you know make a make a grand for a gig and come back and do a 50 dollar gig in new york or a string of 50 dollar gigs you know door gigs in new york because because folks just stacked up the dollars that was the whole thing you know um and music i mean new york and new york has some of the best musicians in the world you know i mean it's like you know like the first call cats here like you never heard of them but you know they're they're the guys that you know uh the folks that if um you tell them on uh on wednesday i need you to learn every song uh, <laughs> on the songs in the key of life by friday they'll come in having that thing down you know um but um but they and but they're working they're working for pennies on the dollar man you know yes and uh 
yeah and but they were willing to take all of those those shit gigs you know because it's like the pennies add up you know and now that you know that's not there so you know i mean you know folk folks you know i mean you know folks folks been struggling through it you know folks had to figure something out you know we're in um the entire the entire business of live music is, is definitely going to be about risk and adaptation going forward that's just that's just the way it is it's like you know where what your gut tells you to do you know that's um, yeah that's kind of how i feel um it, yeah. it, it boils down to what you feel comfortable doing and i'm hearing way too many horror stories from people that are actually out there and uh, also i have friends that are touring nationally mm -hmm. That yeah, and doing it on it because all the venues, not all, but a lot of these venues are closed. They're going back to backyard <laughs> shows, house. Yeah, shows. man. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, yeah. I mean, Living Color just did like a little mini tour with a, a bunch of other indie bands mm -hmm. that were popular. Like when they blew up, I think Hobo Stank, you know, was on the on the tour. I forgot the other the other cast, but um, but Vern, <laughs> Vernon told me like. uh he was he was thinking about taking like uh some cruise gig and his wife and daughter just put the foot down on that <laughs> it's like it's like forget a, forget yeah, about do it. not do that you know what i mean don't go on a cruise so it's like but that you know but that gets to what what we, you know we talk about man it's like the the risk and adaptation you know what i mean it's just like is it really worth it you know to do a cruise gig now you know even oh, though the now? money may oh, be no, no 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 yeah 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 but i'm saying but i'm saying like you know like we are we all are not going to be offered the cruise gig living color is you know what i mean That's a good point. so they got a they got a decision to make you know what i mean um because they're crazy people still getting on cruises you know what i mean taking cruises and they're, they're taking these music theme cruises too you know and like and if you look you know it's, it's that thing like well, living color don't want to do it some other band will you know um but yeah i mean on the whole go going forward thing like that's that's just my you know like i mean you know kind of the same place you know yeah you know it's no, like I'm, uh, I'm, yeah i'm terrified you know. of uh, what what scares me more is uh and I, and I and i know if you guys have this where you you guys are i'm assuming it's everywhere um yes yeah. eric and marcus people making fake vaccine cards yeah yeah we got plenty oh, of that here God. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen that. But you know, I think that's. But what we we, we have had to respond to is, um, um, we got we got members who, for personal, political, medical reasons, are are aren't uh, plan to never get vaxxed. You know, mm -hmm. and like right now, the situation is such that everything we're offered is requiring people to be vaxxed to play. Yeah. But, you know, there's some situations that have also coming up there outdoors where um, they're not requiring that. And, you know, so we had to just, you know, we had to put it to a vote in the band. You know, I mean, you know, about how do you feel about rehearsing and performing with folks? And, you know, um, would, would a 72 hour COVID test, basic free COVID test be enough? Or are you going to require folks to, if they want to play? They gonna have to spend that, you know, two fifty to three hundred to get the uh, the PCR, you know, like that's. But that th these are things that are on the table now, you know, for like working musicians. You know? Well, we just we just um, lost in the Bay Area a pretty well known rapper uh, Zion I, who uh, did not mm -hmm. want to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. and he caught yeah. COVID and yeah. sadly passed away. Yeah, yeah, and um, and it's to the point, man, where you know it's like. These are, you know, you know, and I like these are our homies, man. These are people like some people been with the band from the beginning, yeah, from before the beginning. You know, I go, I go back with some of our folks, like <laughs> you know, to one, well, you know, to Howard and the founding, foundings, you know, Howard in the seventies and the founding of the BRC in the in the eighties. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, but you having to you having to make these decisions like by kind of democratic consensus because, like you got you got folks in the in the in the in the in the band who like they're not they they are about zero tolerance when it comes to taking a risk of being in a room 
with with somebody that's not vaccinated you know like um and this is this is what's on the table you know like people you know again around this whole question about like what does the future look like this this is the future now this is what the future looks like you know like um um you know and i, I mean and i'm sure it's going it's like our band we got enough people to cover <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes the, like the exclusions you know but you know you're dealing with like you know duos trios quartets quintets and whatnot it's like yo man it's like civil war families are coming apart <laughs> <laughs> well there's some band some big band just broke up Derek. what band was that that just uh dropped their drummer because he would know oh yeah yeah I, yeah offspring, yeah, I offspring or yeah, it's offspring. offspring yeah yeah i think it's offspring yeah man yeah yeah, yeah drop the yeah, drummer you know. like you gotta go it's like yeah, you know, see you. Got to keep them separated, together, right? That's his love. <laughs> <laughs> love, love you, man. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. You know, we'll 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 see you at the Kmart. <laughs> like, yeah, man. That's uh, you know, and and I, it, you know, it's, it's kind of like in my in my mind. I always like to. I'm about just thinking about short-term forecasting you know in the sense that i'm curious about well where possibly might me be why me might we be um six months from now Mm -hmm. you know like Mm kind of going into the next spring you know because i mean winter's gonna like make a lot of this these conversations about touring everything and even having outdoor venues to you know kind of kind of moot but um uh yeah like where where is it all gonna be like come come april you know um a little more than six months but you know you Lam- get lambda point. lambda yeah. variant um so yeah. greg we are coming up on our yes. tail end, tail end. Uh, i want to pr- thank you so much for taking the time out to come and talk about some kind of some su- subject matter controversial some not but um, I yeah. really, uh, I'm glad I was able to do this because when I, my, my host, Jason Miles, you know, we, we, you know, we bring, you know, we we're friends, brothers. Sometimes we disagree. Yeah. But, and no, I was, yeah. I, no, I we need this, man. We need this. I just mentioned to him, I was like, you know, I'm Facebook friends with Greg Tate. He was like, you know, Greg Tate. I was like, well, I don't know him. I'm Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, maybe I can get him on the show. He was like, no, you're killing me. I was like, well, I'll just ask the brother if I can get him on the show. I commented yeah, you know, on the wall before yeah. you do. We fought. We fought. We fought. You know, I'm like, yeah, I think he knows who I am. I'll ask him, and he was like, "Down." And, Mark, yeah. and uh, Jason was like, "He's going to do it." He was like, "Yeah, he's going to be on the show." And um, so yeah, I man. just wanted I wanted you to know that I feel good that for my man Marcus, who recently celebrated a birthday, who was on vacation, right. that you were able yeah. to come on the show because you know I like when Marcus is happy about his music. As mm-hmm. somebody who's trained in something that has limited limited in its creative value which is the law i appreciate that right. my intellectual partner on this show is someone who does music because i find people uh, particularly black folk who are created yeah. artistically to be this fascinating amazing people so uh, i just want to let you know how happy it made me to have you here to make him happy since i'm learning now yeah. that you are kind of the role model that helped one of the role models that helped him get into his position as a black, you know, heavy metal guitarist. And uh, I want to thank you so much for doing, serving that so we can have young brothers. Oh, like man, we, man, we, we, man, we all just passing it forward. You know what I mean? Paying it forward. You know what I mean? Like, um, like, cause Vernon and I talk about it all the time. Like, you know, when we were, when we were youth, you know, in, in DC and Brooklyn, you know, coming up, it was always, um, you know, it was always like older cats that kind of pulled us aside and said, you know, said, yeah, check this out or, you know, supported us or trained us. You know what I mean? And so you kind of, you know, you, you knew when you got the opportunity, like you had, you know, you had to pay that forward, man. So, you know, glad, glad I could be of some, some assistance to the brothers, you know, uh, and the Black Rock Coalition and, and, and our compadres and, fishbone and, and bad brains and living color you know like really really really
provide an example like you can do this you know and um and you know i mean and then on the piece just about you know like having um like you know bringing like musicians into the into these conversations man is really critical because you know some of the, some some of the most advanced critical thinkers i know are musicians and they have also figured out ways within that gig economy to 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 not compromise themselves stay true to the art and and still keep the bills paid you know because um you know i mean um yeah because somehow my you know my folks have figured it out for the last year and a half it's like you know um and it, and it ain't and it ain't been off of no trump stimulus checks so <laughs> you, <laughs> trump, you know what i mean like i mean it, but yeah i mean but you know like play players are resourceful you know musicians are artists are resourceful you know what i mean like you know i mean artists are the one i mean you know we know that like every gentrified neighborhood started out being somewhere that 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 uh you know where angels and only musicians dared to tread you know what i mean it was just like like but you know bombed out sections of of cities you know it's like oh oh they got but they got some room in there for me rehearse hey i'm going to that <laughs> you know well, well, listen man i hope you feel, i hope you enjoy your experience here enough to, to try to come on and we invite you again oh no 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 homie no homie look yo like um um we having this Frank Wilderson in the black middle class. <laughs> no, it's like, like you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, like it's 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 cool pushing back on Earth with a fire as yacht people. That's easy, you know what I mean? Like, no, we, you know, no, we, we, you know, like yeah, you know, we we. No, I, I want to get into those 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 class complexities, which, you know, and the whole notion of of uh, you know black middle class rad radicality and service to the service to the race you know all of that oh no so we definitely definitely man you know, i mean i've been a, i've been an admirer <laughs> of your social media commentary your work at the voice i remember you from back in the days of the voice your writings your books as well so i mean i you know whether i agree or disagree man i always appreciate yeah. what you have to say but one thing i got to do <laughs> is respect your your the, the the breadth of your knowledge and intellectual rolodex of black popular culture and music knowledge, which is, you know, you all the if, if there's a black music documentary that's good and you ain't in it, I I you know I I don't know <laughs> that it exists. No, no, it's it's funny, man, about the Rick James thing. This this friend of mine, like, she has seen me in so many documentaries. So when she heard about Rick, she said, You in that? I said, No, no, I mean, you know, they you know, they, they got uh they got Ty Boy, they got Jason King. She was like, Why not? <laughs> Because <laughs> like, Todd Boyd be fucking fighting I, 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 Oh yeah, yeah. It's like yeah, I, it's like I don't really have to be in every one for it to be legit. Out of, you know, square bits, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, guys, uh, thank you that very note, much. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, thank, on. thank you all. Yeah, the, the herd, the herd, and the unheard. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a lovely limited edition Bitter Lake hoodie you're wearing, Marcus, that no one else can buy. And uh, in the spirit of uh, Black Rock, let's uh, go out with some uh, heavy metal. <laughs>